It's time for Ask the Tech Guys. I'm Leo Laporte. Coming up, I'm going to show you the latest Amazon Echo. Is it worth the steep price? And I'm Micah Sargent, and I will help you get your contacts and calendars sorted on your mobile devices. Then we'll explain why I'm wearing this weird outfit. Ask the Tech Guys is next. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This is Ask the Tech Guys with Leo Laporte and Micah Sargent. Episode 1959 for Sunday, January 29th, 2023. That's thick with two C's. This episode of Ask the Tech Guys is brought to you by Cashfly. Cashfly is the only CDN built for throughput, delivering rich media content up to 10 times faster than traditional delivery methods and 30% faster than other major CDNs. Learn how you can get your first month free at cashfly.com. Thanks for listening to this show as an ad-supported network. We are always looking for new partners with products and services that will benefit our qualified audience. Are you ready to grow your business? Reach out to advertise at twit.tv and launch your campaign now. It's time for... The Tech Guys. Ask the Tech Guys. Hello, Micah Sargent. Hello, Leo. How'd you know it was me? Lucho Laporte. I'm wearing my Mexican wrestler uh, mask with the 49ers on it. I think I'm a little over-geared. You, you know, the hat could go. <laughs> Apparently, there's a football game today. Is the, is the jacket warm? It's really warm. This is what they call a throwback, because they don't make them anymore. Gold Niners jacket. I, uh... So, my wife is a football fan, mm -hmm. and I have become by a football fan by proxy, mm -hmm. and uh, apparently her team is playing uh, in about an hour, so uh, I may be a little distracted. right now? Yeah, I may be a little distracted uh, today. <laughs> this is the show where we answer your computer questions. We talk about computers, the internet, home theater, digital photography. We talk about smartphones, smart watches. We talk a lot about AI these days. Yes, we do. There's a lot of it. Possibility. I asked, uh, there. so you, there's a number of different things that happened all of a sudden with AI mm -hmm. that got our attention. It started with stable, actually probably with Dolly 2, when uh, OpenAI opened access to its image generation, artificial intelligence. I read something good, and I like this because it kind of explains to me what's really going on okay. with AI. It's not technically exactly right. Okay. But if you think about Dolly with images or stable diffusion or mid journey or chat GPT with text, it's best to compare it to uh, autocorrect. We've played this game, haven't you? Where you go into your phone and you type a word and then you pick you just go from autocorrect and you yeah. keep typing and it generates a, a sentence mm -hmm. based on what it knows about you and kind of weak rules. But what if you had a really strong set of rules for the autocorrect? Okay. That's kind of what ChatGPT is doing. Um, there's another description, and I got we had a question last week, and I and I saw this article, and I thought this is really the best explanation I've seen yet uh, of what our question was last week. Should we worry about our jobs? This was an interview from the Markup at themarkup.org, decoding the hype about AI. Julia Angwin, in conversation with Arvind uh, Narayanan, who is uh, a professor of art, of, I guess. Professor of Artificial Intelligence? I don't know. <laughs> is, that a, is that a thing? He is uh, an expert writing a book called AI Snake Oil right now. Mm -hmm. um, he is a Princeton computer science professor. He uh, is, this became well known because he did a talk, How to Recognize Snake Oil in AI, some years ago. But uh, Julia Angwin interviewed him for uh, the markup, and I thought he said something very interesting at the end. Before I get to that, though, I'm going to mention... An analogy he gave, which I really liked. You remember when? Com <laughs> Did you ever watch the show Silicon Valley? Yeah. On uh, an HBO. Yeah. You remember that one of the uh, kids living in the startup house came up with his own program, Hot Dog or Not, right? <laughs> yes. Where it could look at anything and tell you if it was a hot dog or not a hot dog. That's all, right? Right. That's how, in a, in a lot of ways, our image uh, AI image stuff started with image recognition. You know, you could type a uh, dog into Google Photos and search for a dog and you'll see a pic all your dog pictures. So it, it started by doing that. He says essentially what's happening is it's doing that in reverse. Once it figured out how it could recognize a dog, 
then it could take from the prompt dog and generate a dog. Got it. Just kind of back up. It's just, it's a similar process. And of course, all of this it's not intelligence. That's a it's unfortunate because that's not a good word for this. But all of this machine learning stuff comes based on looking at a lot of stuff and then uh, deciding based on all that stuff, kind of autocorrect, how stuff's related. So that if you gave it X, it would know Y comes next mm -hmm. in a trivial example. So uh, there, he talks in this article, and I recommend it, about a lot of different uses for AI, some that aren't so good. He says there's a kind of AI where decision makers decide what to do, what something's going to happen in the future. They predict the future. The best known of this is Minority Report, pre-crime, predicting that person's going to be a criminal. But it is actually used, for instance, in parole hearings. Uh, is this person likely to uh, reoffend? Right? Re mm -hmm. And if he is, we're not going to let him out. He says that's the worst use of AI because it's basically taking stat statistics and applying to an individual. Mm -hmm. And as we know, individuals are not statistics. Statistics are... Individuals as a group, not any in a, individual. It's very easy for you or me to, to def, you know, to uh, defy the statistical right. prediction. So it's a bad way to judge to judge people. He says when an intervention is made based on a prediction, we need to ask: Is that the best decision we can make? Maybe the best decision would be not: Is he likely to reoffend? But what could we do to? rehabilitate him yeah <laughs> that might be a better question right, <laughs> right. oh duh uh so anyway uh he it's a great article but let me give you the last paragraph because one of the things that somebody asked us last week and i don't know if we had a great answer was should we be worried about all this ai taking our jobs what is what is the chance that ai is going to take our jobs he says assume some of the wildest predictions about chat gpt the text one mm -hmm. the one that writes are true and it will automate entire job categories by way of analogy, this is again Professor Narayanan, think about the most profound information technology developments of the last few decades, the internet, smartphones. They've reshaped entire industries, but we have learned to live with them. Some jobs have gotten more efficient. Some jobs have been automated, so people have retrained themselves or shifted careers. There are some harmful effects of these technologies. We're learning to regulate them. Even with something as profound as the internet or search engines or smartphones, it turned out to be an adaptation where we maximize the benefits and try to minimize the risks rather than some kind of revolution. And he says, I think, he says, I don't even think large language models like chat GPT are on the scale of that. Now we may disagree on that. I think a lot of us think it is on the scale of smartphones or the internet, but he says, no matter what, there'll be potentially massive shifts, benefits, and risks in many industries, but he doesn't see it as a sky is falling kind of issue. Now, that was the answer I wish I'd given last week. So I thought I'd I'd bring that back up. I think We're, generative AI as a whole is the transformative technology. It's not necessarily one of these individually, but this whole concept as a, a and something going on, right? Play around. Yeah, with there's images, something with, happening with video, with music, <laughs> with all sorts of, and that as a whole, I think, is going to be uh, life changing. There is some AI music now. It's not very good, but there's some very interesting stuff. Uh, Alex Lindsay sent me a YouTube video. I don't know if I can play it. I probably can't of a Billie Eilish song, but AI replaced Billie Eilish's voice with Ariana Grande. Oh, wow. Is it Grande or Grande? Uh, Grande, yeah. Grande. And uh, it's, it, was, it was good. It did very well. That's the kind of thing we're seeing. That is going to get better and better, right? Well, I mean, and when so think about music theory. I'm honestly surprised that music wasn't one of the first things that these scientists tackled, given how mathematical music is and the way that uh, we not only express music but appreciate music and how it is tied to these scales, these mathematical scales, and understanding the the way that you know you resolve a melody. All of that is very rules based. Yeah. And even though there is artistry involved. I'm surprised to not see more generative AI involved with music just yet. Yeah. So uh, anyway, that's yeah. I think it's fascinating. I'll play, if you want later on, we could play. Uh, we could play some music. I have some music. The AI generated music. Google announced a release some this week. Oh, neat. Wait, should I play it now? If I think it, yeah. I got my. I think I've got my audio working. This is always a question. While we're while I'm fumfering around. We are open. The lines are open at call.twit.tv. That is our Zoom 
a line. If you do that, my suggestion is do that on your phone in your browser, call.twit.tv. If you have Zoom on there to launch it, if not, it will pull it up uh, and uh, install it. And then use your phone because your phone's microphone works and camera works. We know that. And we can see you on your phone. Uh, people are so tempted to use their fancy computer setups, and often that makes it harder. But if you've got it and it's working, okay, fine. But we are going to take some calls in just a bit. Call.twit.tv. Uh, coming up, I'm going to do a little demo of the newest uh, Amazon Echo. It's a little creepy. It follows you around. <laughs> it follows you around. Uh, I got this for my mom because I thought, uh, she, you know, she's she's 90 years old, and I wanted to talk to her. And it's getting harder and harder for her to set up the iPad and do the FaceTime. So I said, this way I can just call you, Mom, and you'll hear you know, Leo's calling and she'll press the button and, and I'll I'll be there and she'll be there and we don't have to worry about it. And so nice. far it's worked very well. Maybe if I can get her to answer the phone, we'll call mom. <laughs> she's she's aware we're calling, right? No. Oh. I'll I'll let her know ahead of time. Okay. Okay. <laughs> uh, uh we also have uh, what else do we have coming up? Uh we've got I mean besides calls. We've got some great I, questions. Yeah, we've got some great email. questions and some emails, which yeah. is exciting. Uh ask the tech guys at twit.tv. I'm going to, I forgot, they're reminding me in the Discord, let's go guys, I forgot to tell them we were doing a show, so <laughs> I got to I gotta do that. Uh, one more thing let's talk about before we get to the calls, we got some good ones coming in just a bit, including we've got a good a good shot of somebody's uh, cables, Yes, which should be a lot of fun. He, the cables have their hands raised, so I think they want to know something. We'll, we'll go there, <laughs> should, we, should we not go there first? Let's not go there. <laughs> Sometime along the way. <laughs> we'll talk to Joe Cable. Joe Cable. Uh, but first, I wanted to talk about uh, Corey Doctorow's, I thought, very... Uh, Corey is so good at crystallizing stuff. And I thought his article was really, really good. He uh, uses a bad word in the title, and I want to use a bad word. So I'm going to say the insurtification uh, of TikTok is mm -hmm. the name of the article. TikTok's insurtification. You can take the R out and you'll get an idea of what, <laughs> what's going on. Um, but we're in the good place right now, aren't we? And mm. we're going to say that. So uh, he, make, he makes a really interesting uh, point, I thought, as well. He says, here's how platforms die. We're talking Facebook or Google or, or really anything. It doesn't even have to just be in technology. First, number one, they're good to their users. Then, number two, they abuse their users to make things better for their business customers. Oh. And three, finally, they abuse those business customers to get to make profit, to claw back all the value for themselves. Four, everybody says, this place is insurtified and leaves. Wow. He says, Amazon did exactly this. When Amazon first started out, it was all about the customer, right? We're going to serve the customer. In fact, they had lower prices and free shipping or low-cost shipping. They subsidized it all. They weren't stupid. The idea was get customers locked in. We talked about Amazon Smile last week. They got rid of their charity platform. That was all about getting people locked in. Mm -hmm. And and uh, then the next step was to get business customers to use it. And that's when they created the marketplace. Half of what you buy on Amazon now is not sold by Amazon, but a third party. So they got the third party sellers all, all locked in, right? And then the final step, which is since everybody's locked in, uh, we are going to capitalize on this. We're going to make money on it by basically ransoming access to the customers. When you first, in the early days of Amazon, when you searched on Amazon, you'd probably find the best product at the lowest price. Mm -hmm. Now you find the advertised product. And, and he says, this is what they did to the marketplace users. They said, if you want to be in the marketplace, you've got to return as much as 45% of your profits to us in the form of, of advertising. So lots of business customers come in. The strategy meant it was harder for shoppers to find anything anywhere except Amazon. That meant they searched on Amazon, which meant that sellers had to sell on Amazon. That's when they started harvesting the surplus from its business customers, stage two, right? Uh, maybe that's, that's stage three, I guess. Yeah, that's stage three. And essentially, he says, if you search for cat beds on Amazon... The entire first screen is ads, including ads for products Amazon cloned from its own sellers, putting them out of business. That's the big one, right? Those Amazon Basics products. Third parties have to pay 45% in fees to Amazon, but Amazon doesn't charge itself these fees. Profit, right? All told, the first five screens of ads for cat beds 
of, of results for cap ads are 50% ads. Now, at some point, it gets so bad that you leave the platform. Mm -hmm. We're not there yet. Not for Amazon, yeah. We were there for Facebook. Same thing happened to Facebook. Uh, at first, the proposition, the value proposition was you get a great place to stay in touch with family and friends. Then they got the publishers to start putting their content on there. Then they got them all locked in. And then they said, the heck yeah, with you. It was off. I remember uh, working in a company when that was going on, where we published and Facebook was, you know, big for us. And then suddenly the video views that we thought we had did not actually match what was actually happening. And that, that just dropped as Facebook sort of looked internally for ways to make money themselves. Corey writes, today Facebook is terminally insurtified. A terrible place to be, whether you're a user, a media company, or an advertiser. It's a company that deliberately demolished a huge fraction of the publishers it relied on, defrauding them into a pivot to video based on false claims of the popularity of video among Facebook users. If you even saw a tenth of a second of a video, it would count you as a view, yep. right? Mm -hmm. uh, companies threw billions into the pivot. The viewers never materialized. Media outlets folded in droves or sold as your company did to Equity Capital. Yep. But Facebook has a new pitch. <laughs> <laughs> it's starting over. It claims to be again. called Meta, and it demands that we live out the rest of our days. Corey is such a good writer. As a legless, sexless, heavily surveilled, low-poly cartoon character. <laughs> Woohoo! <laughs> Woohoo! Uh, uh, so he, this, he starts, the title is uh, The Insurtification of TikTok. He says, TikTok's not quite there yet, but when it first started, right, at first... It, its algorithms were were great for creators, right? Mm -hmm. uh, actually, it was great for users because they gave you what you wanted. Then they said, now we got to get the businesses involved, get the creators involved. And so they started putting, they, they have what they call a, a heat button that they would press on creators they wanted to. He says, it's like a carny. You ever play the carny games? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yes. You get some people to win. Yeah. Right? So he talks about the, the the fruit baskets where you throw something in. He says, in these carny games, they get a little switch they can flip that pops your ball out of the fruit basket so you don't win. He says, they only let people win. They want to let win. So they look for the biggest rube, and they make sure he wins the biggest teddy bear. Then he walks around the carny. Look what I got. Mm -hmm. And it drives traffic. Anyone can get it. So he says, TikTok, it had that little switch, and that's the For You tab. And uh, they put the creators they wanted to promote, like my son, Salt Hank, in there, grew them to vast size. But now, of course, the next stage is going to start to begin. And uh, and that's and that's really what happens to all these platforms. It's And you know what? It's not even something to bemoan. It's the way of the world. It's called capitalism. Yes. And then these platforms wither away, and the next thing takes over. Here's the most important thing, I think. you got to realize that, and you got to know when to leave. you got to know when you're the rube, and that teddy bear isn't really something you want. And you know who's doing this now? Who has a For You tab now all of a sudden? Uh, oh, it doesn't... Um, I can't Twitter. Think of, oh, Twitter has one, but Etsy just got one too. Oh, there you go. Interesting. <laughs> Interesting. So Twitter's at that stage of monetization where screw everybody, right? We're just we're just going to make get as much money out of this as we can. Exactly. Uh, and if you want your posts to be seen by anybody, you're going to be giving us some money. You're going to be giving us some money. They've, they've already said that. They eight dollars for the blue check, but they now are planning a larger business plan where you pay even more if you're a business on Twitter because a lot of businesses now are dependent on Twitter, right, to drive traffic. Your old publication. Yep. Drive traffic through Twitter, right? Well, once they got gotcha, you, then they raise the prices. I think that's pretty obvious. It's why I guess the thing that's uh, really sticking out to me here is how. Quite literally, you can take this and just drop overlay it on all these companies, and you are seeing it yeah. play out over and over and over yeah. again. There's no change. He in says the, way that the, it works. the one remedy that government should take, and I agree with this, is making this stuff interoperable so it's easy for you to leave. Okay. As long as you can leave, then it's fine. Take advantage of the early stage when they're doing a lot of great stuff for you. Uh, if you're a business, take advantage of the second stage when they're doing a lot of great stuff for you. But the minute they start to insurtify, you need to be able to leave. Now, these companies really try to lock you in, and that's where perhaps regulation can help. What do they? What do you mean, or what does uh, Doctor O mean when he says leave? Does that mean go leave to another one? So and, then go to the next. But so, you can leave. I could leave. What yeah, is but, it that I'm but you can't leaving? take with you necessarily that's your followers I mean. or your family or your customers. And so the idea is, government needs to just and it's a simple thing. 
and I think this is this is light-handed regulation, just make sure that it's interoperable, that there's a standard for your follower data, let's say, so that you can export it and then go to the next Got one. It. In fact, the last Congress, I think it's dead in the new Congress, but the last Congress did have a bill for exactly that, interoperability. I, yeah, uh, I remember talking about that. And it was the, that. I think it was the right thing to do. So yeah. anyway, that's the sermon for the day. Thank you very much. Amen. Now we should talk to a real priest. <laughs> uh, let's pick up. I'm, now we have a new system. I'm excited about this. We want to thank Andy Carluccio of Zoom and Zoom ISO. Andy created Zoom ISO, and that's what we're using now for all of our shows. And he wrote us a script. Didn't, it's Andy's script, right? Little script that gives me buttons. This is kind of like the old radio show. It's a big script, <laughs> giant script. Thank you, Andy. So I can see all the people in here. If you raise your hand, I'll know that you're interested in talking. And I'm going to pick up on, uh, let's see. Now I don't see his name on here. Wait a minute. I see I see Kevin's hand is raised. Maybe we, we can have Kevin lower hand and re-raise hand. No, wait. Oh, there it is. It's oh, red. Okay. Oh. Why is it red? Is that good? Does that mean good thing? Maybe it means they've been I'm gonna, on for a while. I'm going to push the button, Kevin. Now, I don't know if you have to still do all that stuff. You do. Maybe you do. Kevin, speak. Let me just see if I can. Yeah. Ah, Kevin. Look at I'm in your circle of light. Yes, this is magic, <laughs> isn't it? Everything the light touches. Now, it says your... SJ after your name. Are you in the Society of Jesus? I certainly am for 50 years now. Wow. Like our own friend, Father Robert. Are you a priest? I am. I'm an antique Jesuit. An antique <laughs> Jesuit. <laughs> antique Jesuit. <laughs> That's wonderful. Robert that's wonderful. Robert's probably about 20 years behind me in the society. I, I was rector of the high school that he went to when he was in high school. Oh, wow. Are you had SI? No, Bellarmine. Bellarmine. I know Bellarmine very well. They had an excellent football team. They did. Bellarmine they did. Prep had a very, good. very powerful football team and uh, yeah. brought a lot of great players to fruition. Well, it's so nice to meet you, uh, Father. It's great to have nice you on. Thank you. I'm down in Phoenix, and I'm a chaplain for Creighton University Health Science Campus in Phoenix. Cool. So I'm a chaplain for the medical school, nursing school, PT, OT, pharmacy, and uh, soon-to-be physician's assistant programs. And I teach in the medical school, medical ethics. Medical I was going to ask you. You do so. You do medical ethics. See, that's fascinating that's awesome. to me, yeah. especially as it we is. get into biotech and and uh, genetic modification. The challenges are huge. It's changing every day. First off, uh, happy birthday to Lisa and happy anniversary to both of you. I forgot to say anything uh, on the air about that. But yeah, one of the reasons I'm wearing this, no, I didn't lose a bet. <laughs> I wanted to honor my wife, who is a massive, lifelong San Francisco 49ers fan and has made me a fan as well. It is our anniversary today. I gave her a Brock Purdy jersey, Mr. Irrelevant yeah. jersey. Yes. So. But I, it, unfortunately, it was too small. But I had, I, as a good husband, mm -hmm. I've learned you start with the smallest size and work your way up right. instead of oh. the largest size and work your way down. I'm so sorry. I'll have to go. Yeah. Yeah. You got, you learn these things <laughs> yeah, uh, in time. Very clever. good marriage advice. Very good. <laughs> very clever. <laughs> what can we do for you, Father? Well, listen, I have a very old iPod. And I'm trying to get, I, I have all of my music that I downloaded from my CDs is on the iPod. And I collect old time radio programs. I taught um, communications and mass media for years. And I have a great collection of old time radio programs that are all on my iPod. And I'm trying to transfer it onto my Mac, but it seems to be impossible. I, I've tried a program called AnyTrans um, from a com company called iMobi. And it starts out and then it closes out and disconnects my iPod. Oh. Is there any way of getting my information off my iPod? Let me ask a couple of questions, and then uh, Micah has a, an answer for you. Is it a how old an iPod? Is it a FireWire connection, or is it's, it you? It's, it's this one, and okay. it is this connector. It's the thirty pin okay. connector. Okay. Got it. So it's almost as old as I am. When Steve uh, Jobs created the iPod, well, he didn't create it, but when Apple created it, and Steve went to the record companies and negotiated, he was a tough negotiator. They said, that's a perfect piracy device. Everybody's mm -hmm. just going to put all their songs on there and bring them over to their friends. They'll co they'll connect it and copy it off. So Apple, I don't think Apple's heart was in it. <laughs> but, but Apple said, all right, all right, all right. We'll make it so you can't just copy songs off of it. But they only kind of did it. 
It's actually fairly easy to. They did it. They did security through obscurity. For instance, the songs don't have the song name on them. The folders are not logical, and the device won't mount as a storage device without some shenanigans on software part. But the good news is, very quickly, people figured that all out and figured out a way you can copy stuff off. And and you're not, you know, unfortunately, you're not alone, Kevin. There are a lot of people for whom this iPod is their music backup. And I tell people, oh, my gosh, don't rely on that as your only copy of your music. But, of course, that's exactly what we do. You know, the computers, we get rid of them, they go away. But the iPod, that got stuck in a cupboard somewhere. So um, I've rec – are you on Windows or Mac? Mac. Okay. That's good. Mac person. That makes it a little easier. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a program called Sanuti, which is iTunes backwards. Oh. <laughs> Uh, that works on Windows, but what do you do? You have a so yeah. I'm I'm leaning towards having you use iMazing. I love iMazing. iMazing. I've been using now for a long time as a means of backing up all of the devices I have. One of the magical things about it is if you if your local storage couldn't support the huge drives that are on some iPhones and iPads, and I need to back it up to a different location. I can do that. But iMazing. It is specifically designed to try and uh, work with so many different iPhones, iPods, iPads, etc. Uh, so even the older ones uh, are, are likely to have support there. Now, uh, in fact, amazing. One of the things that they talk about is a 30-pin connector. You know, as part of the the uh, kind of instructions for doing it, and. Mm -hmm. Amazing as well. Very simple to walk through the steps to do a full backup or even just have the device connected and browse the hard drive on the device. So you don't even necessarily need to do the full backup if, you know, if you're after just kind of getting the music or in this case, the content that you had uh, off of there. Now, um, one other thing I would suggest is depending on what version of Mac OS you are running, uh, you may try a more simple approach rather than, you know, going to a third party uh, software. When you plug it in, um, make sure that you launch f the finder and see if it appears in the sidebar on in finder, because that can sometimes give you everything that you need. Well, you know, you, and I'm curious if, if you did try that as kind of the so first step. We should step. explain that's yeah. something new in I started in I O and Mac OS, uh, I can't remember. Was it Ventura? I think it's two ago. It's two ago. Yeah. <laughs> it got rid of iTunes and they put music as a separate app. And then they put the the actual syncing mm -hmm. of the iPod in the Finder itself, which actually, I guess, makes sense. But it's somewhere nobody looks anymore. Right. So if you open the Finder and if you've got your iPod plugged in, even with a 30-pin cable via USB, it should show up in the Finder as an object. Yes, right? absolutely. You can't just drag files off of it. Can no, you? no. Uh, what will happen is whenever it pops open, you'll see a bunch of different options for syncing it for uh, backing it up that kind of thing and in making a backup of it you would then be able to uh, dig into that backup and find the files that you're looking for so unfortunately uh, it doesn't uh, show up in finder for some reason and that's, it automatically uh -oh. disconnects it okay so whenever you say it automatically disconnects it is uh what does it look like i mean is it disconnecting on the mac's end it's saying hey this is uh you know it's please go ahead. says it on the yeah oh, okay yeah. Oh. And oh. do you have more than one um, 30 pin dock connector? More than one 30 pin cable? Okay. I've tried other ones. Same thing. Yeah. yeah. I would uh -oh. give, I, I believe iMazing has a free trial. Um, okay. And so I would at least give iMazing a try. Something that tries try. harder, maybe. Yes. Yeah. Uh, because it could, yeah, it, who knows what's I'm happening. I'm worried there. that the hard drive on the iPod uh, or the firmware on the iPod is messed up. Something could be, be wrong there. Was that the classic? Is that the, that the really big, this is what, 160 I think it is. Gigs. You know, this is my, my second one. The first one, the battery died, so they exchanged it. Oh, nice. Rather than fixing the battery, they exchanged it. But that was a long time ago. Yeah. Too long. I bought a bunch of them when they dis just before they discontinued it. I knew they were discontinuing it. And uh, and I, I, for a while, had an exchange system with my mom. I would put all, all the music on oh, it. Oh, nice. I'd mail it to her, and she'd send me the other one back so I could update that's nice. it. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Um, it got too complicated for her. So I somewhere there, in, in, probably in the mail, there was a bunch of iPods. Uh, now you could put all the music on one of those small hard drives I and know. move it back and forth. I know. know. And nowadays, of course, 
I mean, the world has changed so rapidly and so fast. People don't even save their music anymore. They just stream it, right? They just buy a subscription. And, and it, it used to be that I had a lot of stuff that I had downloaded. Father, forgive me, Father, for I have sinned. I downloaded from Napster. Uh, and it was low quality, but it was obscure stuff. And then I had some obscure stuff that I had found or ripped. And it wasn't in iTunes. And now everything, like, I don't know how many songs, 80 million songs or something. There's very little that they don't have in iTunes. And probably... They don't have my old-time radio programs. It won't have those. You're right. That's no. a good point. What's yeah, your favorite old-time radio show? Oh, I was partial to The Shadow. I always liked The Shadow. Who knows oh. what evil lurks in the hearts of men. The, the shadow, shadow knows. How do you know that? Because I'm an old man, Leo. Oh, my God. <laughs> Oh um, my yeah, God! Part, part, How did part. you know? You like you? You know? You told me once that you used to listen to old time radio with, with your, my great grandparents. With your great grandparents. That's that's how I know. My dad and I, we couldn't. There was a radio station. This was in the probably in the seventies, maybe the sixties. There was a radio station that broadcast old time radio out of like New York. We couldn't get it in the house, so we'd go out and sit in the car where they had a better oh, antenna, wow. and we would listen to old time radio. Uh, when like, I was teaching communications, I had I had an, uh, a, a modern cathedral radio, but it was you know like oh. an antique. And when I got to the section on radio, I would always play the radio programs through this cathedral radio. You know, it had a, a input in the back. Yeah, and it was amazing how the students in class would pull their desks up close and Isn't watch that the radio. interesting yeah I mean, nothing for the imagine amazing for the imagination nothing like it these days i you know i, I i'm a little I never use this word anymore, but I'm a little too young to remember that. Uh, but I've heard many times that people would sit around the radio like that, like they sit around the TV now, but they would sit around the radio and look at it. So it's interesting that even young people have that do that. impulse to do yeah. that. It's I, a natural reaction. One other question for you. Um, you are able to play the audio on your iPod, right? You can plug in yes. your headphones and listen. No okay. So if yeah. all else fails... What you'll do is you'll plug into that headphone jack with a recorder and then you right. and I, it's going to be a lot of manual work. And, you know, we want to try it this way first. But, it, you know, you don't have to lose these uh, tracks because you can end up just recording them out to something through that audio output. So that's the an so-called analog hole. Yes. And it does bypass all. And for old radio, it's not going to sound any worse. Right. Right. So, <laughs> would you record like with Odyssey or something like that? Yeah. Anything. If you had a tape recorder, you could do it. <laughs> yeah, so plenty of options there. But, yeah, let's give iMazing a shot first. And okay. uh, you can Thank reach you. out to us. Uh, what is it? Ask the tech guys at twit.tv. Yeah. Um, let us know how that goes. Yeah, I would really like and, to And uh, I'll be happy to follow up to yeah. give you some suggestions. Thank you so much, Kevin. It's Thank a pleasure. So it's a pleasure to meet you. And nice says when been a watcher for years oh it's really I, I guess we've never I don't remember talking to you before so it's great to it's great to meet you finally all righty thank you someday Thanks, we'll get up there to visit when please, do. please do please do all God bless we, we need Bye. a chaplain yeah. <laughs> oh, Robert's, <too. laughs> Robert's kind of our chaplain and said the Bellarmine prep you walk into the campus of Bellarmine prep it's like walking into the Fresh Prince of Bel Air it's a fancy school <laughs> very nice school that was a pleasure talking to him alright let's take a little break uh, for word from our local stations all up and down oh no <laughs> never mind uh, coming up I have uh, I'm hoping I'm still hoping I told him he has until uh, 12 noon. We can do parody ads. Have you tried this new dog food? <laughs> <laughs> uh, Leo will now attempt to eat the dog food and <laughs> give you a report back. I asked Alex Lindsay to do a demo of how he makes uh, our beautiful images with Midjourney, which is one of those artificial intelligence art generators, to give us a little demo on Midjourney. Uh, he still he has makes half an hour. Amazing art with it. So I know that we're going to gonna lose him at noon because. Uh, even oh, though he's he a, a Steelers player? fan, he is from Pennsylvania, and I have ah, a feeling okay. that he might transfer his allegiance from Pittsburgh to P to Penn Philadelphia if given half a chance. Our show today is brought to you by our great friends, and when I say brought to you, I mean brought to you quite literally. Our great friends at Cashfly. The whole world, as you know, is moving to digital. Traffic patterns whoosh, spiking all over the place. We're a really good example. Uh, our our you know, download bandwidth is not consistent at all throughout the week like a hum. No, it's more like a scream when a new show comes out. Ah! Everybody downloads it all at once, and then it gets down to a low hum after that. Very spiky, and that's what's going on all over the Internet. 
Uh, but here's the problem. Viewers don't hang around for videos that buffer. You know you don't. Shoppers abandon carts on e-commerce sites that are slow. Gamers leave bad reviews when the latency is high. Be ready for those fluctuations with Cashfly. Expectations have risen. Customers expect a faultless experience when engaging with content on any device, anytime, anywhere in the world. Cashfly is a leader in CDN technology, and they've been doing it since 2002. That's 21 years. Cashfly has held the track record for high-performing, ultra-reliable content delivery for 21 years. They, they've been pioneers in this. They pioneered the use of TCP Anycast, which is an innovation that other CDNs are now just starting to get to and build upon. I know, how do we know this? Because we use Cashfly. We've been using it for more than a decade. Whenever you're downloading a show, whenever you're watching a show on our website, it's coming to you through our CDN, Cashfly. And that's why it's effortless. Downloads come in smoothly, quickly, without error. Same thing with our videos. Cashfly is incredible. They rate it by something they call QOE, quality of experience. It's the single most critical metric when you're serving content simultaneously to a large audience distributed all over the world. And that delivery stack can be your secret weapon. It is for so many companies like ours. With Cashfly, you get ultra-low latency video streaming that delivers video to more than a million concurrent users. Less than one second latency. Gaming? You bet. Lightning Fast Gaming delivers downloads faster with zero lag, glitches, or outages. They can do mobile content optimization for your website, automatic simple image optimization so your site loads faster no matter what device, no matter what size screen. Multiple CDNs means they've got redundancy and failover. They intelligently balance your traffic across multiple providers, giving you the shortest routes and mitigating against performance glitches. Plus, you will no longer pay for service overlap. You get flexible month-to-month -month billing for as long as you need it. Discounts for fixed terms once you're happy. I think, I think we're on a fixed term by now, 10 years in. Design your own contract when you switch to Cashfly. And we loved it because we are we have such spiky usage. They were able to smooth that usage out, uh, smooth the cost outs. We would not be where we are today without Cashfly. I'm eternally grateful. With more than 3,500 clients, over 80 countries, organizations like us consistently choose Cashfly for scalability, reliability, and unrivaled performance. Cashfly, the only CDN built for throughput, delivering rich media content up to 10 times faster than traditional delivery methods, up to 30% faster than other major CDNs. Learn how you can get your first month free with our friends at Cashfly.com. C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com. Somebody in the Discord is saying, where do you buy lossless audio these days? There are plenty of good places uh, to do that. Um, but does, do people really buy <laughs> music anymore? That seems like kind of an old-fashioned thing. For years I've been saying physical media is dead. Forget the CDs, the DVDs, the books, the paper books. We love them still, but it's more of an antiquarian passion, right? Most people are streaming, right? Yeah, sad to say. I think that's the the, the wave of the future. I I uh, have a couple of places I go to get uh, music. iTrax, I T R A X, uh, and uh, A I X Records. Those are two places to get good, high quality, high bit rate uh, content. Uh, actually, I think it was uh, uh, Scott Wilkinson who introduced me to A I X. It's uh, run by a friend of his. They do a lot of their own recording so that they can completely control the uh, the quality of it. Uh, AIX Records. It's also um, Bandcamp. Bandcamp? Oh. You Band like Bandcamp? Band does lossless. All right. So I guess if you've got... Video you know, says indir Bandcamp. direct to artists. Yeah. Indie artists, yeah, yeah. who aren't uh, published. AIX will not have, like, every record you want, but they, because mostly because they do their own uh, recording in 96 kilohertz, 24 bits. So if you want to just hear what it sounds like, it's a great place to go. Yeah, and of course, really beautifully recorded music. Uh, many of the music streaming services uh, have it as part of the subscriptions now. Apple Music, um, almost any new album that's released is going to be uh, going to offer a lossless format. Uh, and that's the thing. I know that uh, several other do as well. Amazon Music being one. Yeah. yeah. Uh, all right, let's go back to the phones. We have many, 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 many more calls, and I've 
I'm very bad about uh, doing this. Let's see who's got their hand raised. This is nice. This is a nice setup. Thank you, Andy. Uh, I see Cody on the line. I don't think we've talked to uh, Cody ever before. All right, Cody, I'm going to press this button and press that button, and you have to accept, and then you will be in like Flynn. <laughs> By the way, do you know the story? You're an old man. You should know what In Like Flynn that comes from. That is something I have heard my grandpa say before, but yeah. I don't know what it comes I from. I am his grandpa. I'll be honest. Age, I should point out. Uh, look up Errol Flynn someday, and you'll see what In Like Flynn means. Now, let's see if we've got Cody on the horn. Cody on the horn. Ho, ho. Cody, where are you calling? Well, no, I, you see, I oh, see. There's Cody. There he is. I see him in. He's using his phone, which I love, and trying to talk to us. You can turn it sideways, believe it or not, and it will fill up the. Oh, it's a big Cody. Where are you calling from, Cody? Duluth, Minnesota. Uh, can you show us the outside? Is it real snowy and cold and freezing and everything? Oh. Yeah, it's, it's pretty snowy, pretty oh, cold. Snow. Michael, you miss that, Micah, don't you? Yeah, I do. I miss oh. the snow so much. What's up, Cody? What can we do for you today? Snow. I'm so glad you called us. Yeah, so I have a question. I was actually hoping to get in uh, on one of your last radio shows, and I never quite made it because you guys were so busy and popular. <laughs> well, it's a little easier these days, I hope. Yeah, so this goes back. I actually called in, I think, early 2020. COVID had just started, and I was trying to stay busy with backing up some old photos and things like that. And what I originally called about then, that project's done. Now I'm at a point now where I have so many photos backed up, and we have a two-year-old who's going to turn three oh, so lots of pictures of our you know only child that i'm running out of storage space in in a few locations was oh, he was your, was he born in covid during campaign yeah so she, wow she was she was born uh valentine's day of 2020 oh, so right before just before <gasps> just yeah. before thankfully you had all these dreams of going to disneyland <laughs> going to the park yeah. Well, I'm glad I'm things, glad she's here. Things didn't exactly turn out uh, the way we thought. You it know, was she's good. so little that she probably this still wasn't too affected by yeah. it yet. Uh, Fingers crossed. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So what's yeah. what? So you got a lot of photos. Yeah. So I I think I have maybe a little bit of an advanced setup. Maybe I give you a little bit of background. Um, I have a Synology four bay uh, NAS at my house uh, with I think eight to nine terabytes of effective storage for the total array. Perfect. And I'm backing that up to a, a separate Synology NAS that's actually at my mother's house. So, you know, the whole is my house, something happens, tornado, fire, whatever. Uh, hopefully that's another, you know, backup means. Nice. Um, in addition to that, I'm using iDrive. Hey, you said. The only issue is I'm up to four terabytes now of, you know, views of what <laughs> Holy is available, must eight be or nine. A lot of available. video along with that photo. Holy unless you just. <laughs> yeah. So I'll share a scenario like Christmas this year, for example. I remember thinking back to my old home videos with when my, you know, dad had his old camcorder and it's fun to look back at some of those. So mm -hmm. I do that now. So when my daughter's old, she can look back oh, and you know, say, oh, remember these fun times. Yeah. But I have a habit of shooting everything, you know, 4K and 30 frames or 60 frames a second. Because your daughter, she's going to have a, you know, a 23K TV. Right. So <laughs> it's just going to say, why exactly. did dad shoot 4K? God, it's so <laughs> blurry. Thank God the upscaling chip in here yeah. is all AI power. Man, yeah. in the old days, it was all 2D. I don't, I don't understand, <laughs> uh, you know. That's great. It's so good you're doing that. But yeah, it does start to fill up, especially those videos. Uh, you're, I think, so what's the problem that you're seeing? Is it just too much? Well, I, I can just see that, you know, that this four bay NAS that I bought about yeah. a year ago. Yeah. It was a bit of an investment and I had to, you know, talk my yeah, wife into it. Said expensive. It wasn't it's like a whole Throwing computer. money at something we didn't need. Um, and I, I can see, you know, that's going to get eaten up and I'm going to need a, something bigger, you know? So is there, a, is there a better process? Is there a compression tool somewhere? Is there something else I should be considering or a best practice? I, you know, the, what's wild is there's someone here who knows a whole heck of a lot about taking photos and videos. And I am curious about the backup process. Yeah, why don't you go over uh, to the, the radio corner and help us out Because we're curious if you've got Aunt a Pruitt, lot of photos. Aunt Pruitt, our host of hands-on photography has probably some solutions. I can tell you what I do. I also have a Synology, and Synology does have a Photos app that's a decent yep. replacement for Amazon or Google. 
Um, honestly, I still use the cloud. Uh, I have all my photos are backed up to Google Photos because I have a Pixel phone. I have unlimited backup there. Amazon, if you have an Amazon Prime account, also unlimited there. I wouldn't. Tr I wouldn't trust that they're always going to be around. But for the interim, uh, they survive. I think the. I think the Synology is a great way to do it. You know what I ended up doing with my Synology when I got a new one. <laughs> that's in your future probably <laughs> when i got a new one i took the old one to work here oh. and synology has a, a tool called hyper backup that lets you synchronize two synologies mm -hmm. so i have my synology at home backing up everything and then at its leisure in the background it synchronizes with the synology here so they're actually duplicate and i am now fairly confident that unless a bomb hits petaluma right uh, in which case it <laughs> probably doesn't matter, matter. yeah <laughs> but uh that i will have uh everything and, and the photos it's a really good example of something you really always always want to keep around uh aunt pruitt is uh is a professional photographer they have an even higher burden you know you do a wedding you would darn well better not uh lose those photographs hey aunt hello sir i'm so glad you're here in your clemson orange beautiful orange right yeah <laughs> yeah that's gorgeous so I'm sure you've addressed this on hands-on photography. What do you What do you recommend? What was I'm sorry I couldn't hear the question. Here He's got in the a lot. Studio. Well, basically, I didn't have any cans on? Oh, well, basic. So you just sit there. What are you doing? Yeah. You I just, stare. I, I watch paint dry over here on the studio. That's all. <laughs> yeah, we love you. I can't. You know, you're so nice to come in and, and help us out on this. I really appreciate it. Um, he has a two-year-old and has a lot of 4K video, a lot of photos. He's got two terabytes now oh boy. of content. He's been backing it up to a, a, a Synology, which is is big, but yep. but it's good. he's going to run out because it's only a four-bay Synology Unfortunately. at some point. One thing to look at, I should mention, uh, 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 that is good about Synology, and you have to check which Synology you have, but, uh, Cody, many of these Synologies, you can connect an external additional uh, without getting a okay. new synology exactly um, just daisy that's, chain that's why when you look at the Might model easier sell. yeah the, when you look at the model <laughs> number the first part is how many total drives and the second part is the year so if okay. so if you if your model number is 2223 it can handle 22 drives now you don't have 22 drives but that's with an extender yep. and then it's the sure. year 23 so one thing you could just get more storage and the synology i you know is is pretty reliable unless there's a fire or something that physically destroys it it's pretty reliable in backup and what do you do it's funny you say that because i was going to mention the same thing it's just daisy chaining because getting a, an additional nas can be really expensive <laughs> it sure is. Um, and then hot swapping with larger drives is another option but again it could be a bit costly at times so yeah. uh, a lot of times just getting an extra uh, connection to your existing nas is a good option and do you use any compression okay. stuff like uh, to, to archive things that, you know, for you've video, 100,000 photos and you know you're not going to look at all 100,000? For video, I do not compress, but for photos, uh, Lightroom has a tool built into it, Lightroom Classic, that is. I take all of my raw files for the previous year and convert those raw files into compressed DNG files. And that allows me to still retain a lot of data just in case I need to go back and pull that those photos back up and retouch them and send them out again i have that option of doing that without losing uh quality here's an example if you had a, a synology uh for instance uh 1517 uh this would be the year 2017 and a 15 drive synology it only has four or five drives but you could buy the extender that it had an additional five drives now Spousal acceptance factor is still an issue because <laughs> yeah, it that doesn't pricey. it doesn't include the drives <laughs> Uh, I mean, it's a little less expensive because it doesn't include the brains either, mm -hmm. but uh, it's gonna sure. it's gonna add up. But that is one way to expand uh, the Synology. I ended up uh, every every about five years, Synology makes enough of it. Synology is what we call a NAS network attached storage. It's a basically a headless computer. It doesn't have a keyboard, mouse, or monitor. It connects to your network, but it has a processor in it. It has RAM in it. It has a lot of storage. That's the chief benefit. It's got a ton of storage. And you connect it to your network, and you can use it for a lot of things, serving media. A lot of people put Plex on it, serve media. You can use it to backup, of course. Uh, you could put backup software on all your systems, including your phones and your tablets, and it will automatically all back up to the Synology. And then you can, as, as, as uh, you're doing, you can hook up the, the Synology software to iDrive and have it back up to the cloud, which gives you really 
a pretty good that's that three to one backup we talk about where you have three copies of everything two different storage media and one at least is off-site and when you look at your online backup services check check out their terms and and, and services because sometimes you'll see in the fine print that if you remove a drive from your home system and even though you may have already backed it up to the cloud, once you remove it from the home system, that cloud service will say, hey, that drive doesn't exist anymore. So they will take it off. Wow. So okay. keep that in mind. Good yeah. Day. Yeah. I, you know, uh, yeah, it's. Uh, so it sounds like what I would do in this situation. It's belt and uh, suspenders is what I would do. <laughs> is yeah. I yes. go on Amazon, well, I go wherever, once a year and I buy an external drive. I mark it with the year. I plug it into my Synology for, and this is for the year past. So it's 2023. So then all of 2022 or 2021's photos and videos go onto this drive. Mm -hmm. And then I freed up a bunch of space. And then I've always got those external ones that are separate from the, yep. not, the NAS that I'm regularly pulling from. As an archive. Because the yeah, logic yeah. is you're not going to necessarily grab that stuff quickly from last year. You know, mm -hmm. it's the same idea that I have with my photos. I, I'm pretty sure I'm not going to open up something from 2021 today in 2020. Well, and you can extend that to the cloud, know? by the way, if you're willing to roll your own. Instead of going with a service that does it all like iDrive and has terms of services you've got to pay attention to. You can buy from Amazon. They have a service called Glacier. Oh, yeah. Which oh. is exactly that idea, which is it's cheap long-term backup mm -hmm. uh, because they don't even keep it online. They move it offline. They put it somewhere. I don't know where in a closet somewhere in, in Jeff Bezos's garage. <laughs> mm -hmm. and they have so a Burke. The deal, the deal <laughs> is that it, it's going to be slow to get it back. Yeah. The premise being back, yeah. you're rarely going to ever want it back, but, but you can kind of guarantee it's going to be there forever. So, uh, that's that's uh, the Amazon and many many cloud storage companies have something similar. Yeah, Backblaze uh, I know does. Yeah, um, Wasabi does. Gla Glacier on Amazon is a good example of that, and it's pretty cheap. It's you know what you always want to look at with Amazon, for instance, is they charge you for egress. They charge you when mm -hmm. you're going to get the stuff. Now in this case, you don't care because you you're hoping you're uh, probably never going to need it. It's more like belt and suspenders. It's an insurance policy, and so. You don't care how much they charge you for egress. You want it, you want it the lowest possible price for storage, and that's what Glacier does. It, it's it, sure. it, 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 it's inexpensive to store, but it's time consuming and expensive to get back. But that's fine. As a, as a as a one who doesn't have all of the knowledge that you have, what I was thinking about this whole time is why don't I just have a script that looks at all of the files I have on my network attached storage and says if the files are two years or older, then compress them all into, you know, zip or even a, a more powerful uh, archive. And then they're there, but they're smaller, they're taking up less space, and then it just keeps doing that. And if I ever need to, I can just uncompress them. So I'm making space for things. But the problem those... is you can't really compress binary files, especially video files that uh, much. They're already pretty compressed. Okay. You're not going to get a lot of space back. I Got mean, it. Yeah, yeah, I don't even think about it with video. Photos, yeah, yeah but definitely don't even think about it with They're videos. already pretty compressed. That's the whole point. I guess you could convert it to H.265, which is a, a much more efficient codec over uh, MPEG-4. But uh, I wouldn't. That's a lot of time consuming. Yeah, transcoding. a lot of I processing power. I was gonna say you, you yeah. have to. What's your daughter? Encode what, it. It takes a lot of juice. To exactly. Do that. What's your What's your daughter's name, uh, Cody? Eleanor. Eleanor. Aww. Do you call her Ellie? We call her Ellie. Yep. Aww. <laughs> little <laughs> Ellie. So this happens so fast. My little Abby, who uh, is now thirty. Uh, <laughs> Uh, does want these old photos. I was very pleased in old videos. Uh, I had a video of her when she was about Ellie's age, maybe a little bit older, uh, showing me a drawing that she'd done. And I, and, I, and I showed it to her, and she burst into tears. Oh. It was so cute. She was so happy to see it. So it, you're doing the right thing. One other thing I wish I had done, and everybody who has little kids should do this, create a Gmail account in their name, I think Gmail will be around for another 20, 30 years. I'm hoping. That's the one thing Google hasn't killed. Yeah. Create a <laughs> Gmail account in their name and send them an email every once in a while with some pictures in it. Just saying, hey, today we went to the park and uh, I took these pictures of you. Can you imagine oh, that's getting so those? Neat. You get to log into the email one age. day and oh. There's all these letters from I mom would and dad. Just cry. It is. It's just gonna. I think you talked about that on the radio show, and I actually took your advice and oh. set that up. Oh, that's oh, amazing! Good call. Yeah, you're a good daddy. 
Hey, Cody, have a great day. It looks pretty cold. In, did you say Duluth? Duluth, yeah, it's Duluth. pretty cold. It's four degrees, according to my, uh, my truck. It, oh. it's, it's the warmest it's been for a while. Did you go into the truck so that Ellie wouldn't make noise? <laughs> He's napping. Yeah, so I'm outside so I don't make any racket. Oh, though. so he wouldn't wake her up. Yeah, yeah that's a good yeah, dad. Look at that. Go year. back in good and cuddle grief. that special, special, special package. <laughs> that special that's baby. Great. Oh, I'm so jealous. Those are great days. I know it's hard work. It's the hardest work you'll ever do, but uh, you look back on it. It goes quick. It goes, it's, it goes way too quick. Thanks. So great to talk to you, Cody. Thank you, sir. Have a Thank great everybody. day. Stay warm. Four degrees. Thanks. I don't remember what four degrees is like. <laughs> Thank you, Ant. I saw it. Thank you, Ant Pruitt. Hands I don't on. want to know what four degrees feels Twitch. like. TV Good grief. On. You never lived anywhere cold? I've gotten down to nine, and that was cold enough. Bad. Oh, Missouri remember, gets down to negative temps, baby. I remember uh, five degrees in Toronto, but that's about as cold. I saw the... Uh, the coldest it ever got. Where did I see that today? Should I saw that be. on Reddit. Sixty-five below. Yeah, should be. Um, uh, it was Nome. It? I think it was Nome, Alaska. Oh, because and it was so cold that the breath that you know normally it's steam when it comes out, it would freeze and drop to the wow. ground. Wow! <laughs> it would just turn into powder <laughs> as you breathed it out. Uh, yeah, it was five degrees. It was so cold. I felt like my tongue was freezing. <laughs> That's cold enough. All right. I got a hand raised. Uh, we appreciate all the calls at calls.twit.tv. Thank you for doing the zoom with us. I think mm -hmm. that's great. Uh, I'm going to go to Glenn. So prepare yourself, Glenn. You're going to get a little pop-up message here and it's going to say, uh, accept. And when you do, you will be on the air. There he is. He's joined us. Glenn, where are you calling you go, from? Got it. Hi, Glenn. Hey, Glenn. Uh, from another cold place known as Massachusetts. <laughs> <laughs> where are you? That's right. Are you walking down the hall of your house? I am. I'm walking down because I need to turn the uh, volume up for my lovely wife, Tammy. Hey, Tammy. Hi, Tammy. <laughs> Hold on, because she's the one with the problem. See, I love we this, that one. we can get vi uh, video now. It's so much more it fun to fun. see people. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, Tammy. It's so much oh, fun. Oh, Tammy. It's the stream. She can't hear me. It's the stream, so there's a little bit of a on. Yeah, yeah, it's a little bit and of a And I'm wearing headphones so yeah. I can walk around. Yeah. Anyhow. Um, so we've been fighting with Tammy retired at the beginning of the year after 37 years in UMass. So that's great. Great totally school. Awesome. Was she at Amherst? Uh, at Amherst, Amherst yeah. yeah. She, nice. Yeah, she was a uh, chemical engineering uh, student advisor. So Lo pretty cool. Really cool. good school. Yeah. Yeah. So um, so in her retirement, she gave back her um, uh, college computer and we bought or she bought herself uh, Air, uh, Mac Air. M2. Oh, so, Mike and I both have yeah. that. What color did she get? Yeah. Uh, some kind of silvery. Thing. Oh, we got the midnight <laughs> was, blue. We got the, the whatever blue. it was. It was pretty. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Good. Um, uh, so anyway, one of the problems we're having is probably an easy solve for you is she's been uh, trying to sync all of her calendars and everything. Of course, we're not Mac people or I'm not Mac people, she is, but you know, the whole Mac ecosystem thing, which is supposed to be a no brainer, uh, is having a hard time syncing with her iCloud to put her calendars onto her, on her yeah. new iMac air. Yeah. And, uh, we just got the, while we've been sitting on a hold here, we got the Google calendar to sync with her Mac calendar finally on her computer. But when she goes to iCloud, it's not repopulating and fixing it there. What say you? Yeah, so this is, it's interesting how often this question comes up. And I think part of the problem, what we end up seeing is it depends on when folks are logging into which account. So if, I'm going to put this in terms, Tammy will understand. It's a chemical valence issue. <laughs> 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 Go ahead. I'm sorry. So, um, I, that's as far as I can go. Yeah, yeah. It stops there. Uh, so, yes, look at those covalent bonds and check if the electrons are positively charged. No. So, depending on when you log in first, uh, oh, yeah, they would be negatively charged. Yeah. I'm getting uh, frowns from, from the audience. Anyway, uh, so you want to uh, look into the settings and see how you have your accounts 
chosen. So on, you know, whether it be an iPhone, an iPad, what have you, when you go into the settings and for example, we're looking at calendars here, I would tap on calendar and then I tap on accounts. You can choose kind of which account ends up being the main account, the default calendar that is used. And that's where I see a lot of people have this issue is they don't have the default calendar set to the one that they want. And so the other one ends up popping up first and foremost. And that is where the problem comes in because then you're going and looking, you can't find it. I, you know, it's funny. I spent uh, the last, my weekend, uh, which was yesterday. Can you mute him for just a little bit? Cause we're getting some feedback through uh, uh, doing this. Mm -hmm. I decided that uh, I didn't want, I've been using Google. I mean, really the key in my opinion is to one. pick one mm -hmm. cloud provider and make that your dominant cloud provider. If you're a Mac user, iCloud makes a lot of sense. If you're cross-platform like I am, iCloud works, but it's not ideal. Maybe it's better to use something like Google, which works on Android, Windows, Mac, iOS, everywhere, even Linux. Uh, but there is a standard for this. There's a CalDAV, CardDAV, yes. and IMAP standard. These are, <clears throat> these are the three big standards that Google supports, anybody will support for having a centralized calendar. I like the idea of a calendar in the cloud because if you have multiple, end up having multiple devices and almost everybody has at least a, a, a computer and a phone, that's mm -hmm. multiple devices and you end up having more or, and this is what Lisa and I do, if you want to share with Tammy, if you want to share a calendar, she wants to share with you, I have Lisa's personal calendar shared with me. I subscribe to it. She has the same for me so that when we, she, she or I make an appointment, we don't conflict you know, we can say, oh, good, we can we can go, you know, do this, uh, see this show or go to dinner or whatever. So it's nice to have that in a family to have shared calendars. So, again, having a cloud solves all that. Mm -hmm. But pick one. iCloud's good if you're all Mac, all Apple, I should say. Uh, Google's good if you're really cross-platform. But I lately just decided to turn them all off and go with Fastmail, our sponsor, Fastmail. I've been a user of Fastmail for email for a long time. And I knew that they supported, besides IMAP, IMAP supports email and notes and reminders but i knew they also supported caldav and carddav which are the two standards for <clears throat> cloud calendars and cloud address books mm -hmm. and so i now you gotta be careful because one of the things apple will tell you as soon as you turn off connection to icloud is well that means we're going to erase everything on the calendar so before <laughs> you do that you want to connect them all up and make sure they're all synchronized and that everything is somewhere. Yes, exactly. <laughs> uh, and uh, one of the things uh, a good calendar program will do, I, I moved off of Fantastical, which I used for a long time, because they raised their subscription significantly. Yeah. And it irked me. Yeah. Because uh, I don't want to pay $50 a year for a calendar. So I moved to something I'd used. Uh, frankly, Apple's calendar is fine. Yeah. Apple's uh, address book is fine. But I thought I should try some others. I moved to a program I used to use for years called BusyCal. Uh, and they have busy card as well, or busy contacts as well. Um, and just to try it out, it's $33 a year. It's a little less expensive. But uh, anyway, it will do a backup automatically, and I like that. That's a nice feature. I think every calendar program should have, Apple does not have, which is it will every periodically make a copy of everything and store it That's off nice. the cloud Yeah, because you're going to screw it up. At some point, you're going to get 15 copies of the same address or something. And so, so that's problematic. So I think it's really important that you, you know, pay attention to this. Backup's very important. Um, I would pick one cloud. Bef what I recommend doing, I don't know if you've ever done this, is at some point go through everything and clean it up. Yep. Make it perfect. Then save it to a drive. Say, don't have it on the cloud at all. S export it. That way you've got the perfect address book, the perfect calendar. <laughs> and now you can start messing around because synchronization is notorious for screwing these things up. Now you can start messing around. Uh, I used Fastmail. I'm very happy now. Everything's on Fastmail. Uh, I haven't yet turned off Google and iCloud. I will at some point, although I think having iCloud is probably a good thing uh, for backup. So, so you've seen this happen, though, uh, Mike? Yeah, it's it's a very common occurrence, unfortunately, because uh, I think Apple is sort of trying to balance using all of those technologies that are available while also making it <clears throat> so that their internal technologies work. And that is where uh, the confusion ends up happening. So um, one thing that I want to recommend or suggest is uh, f sort of using 
the system the way that it's intended. So if we can show my screen real quick. Uh, so here on the Mac, I have gone into the system settings and you may think, oh, I want to add my calendar. So I'm going to go to the calendar app and add my calendar. I'm going to suggest that's not where you do it. Instead, you scroll down until you find internet accounts, you choose add account, and then you add that other account that you're trying to connect to. So if it was a Google uh, account that you were using, a Microsoft Exchange, whatever, you click on that, you sign in here, and then it's going to let you sync the different tools that are available. So we were just talking about CalDAV. We were talking about uh, CardDAV, those, those different technologies that are, is it CardDAV? Yeah. Yeah. They're basically valence matching technologies <laughs> to make sure that you, uh, that you, uh, you know, all the electrons can, can, can bind without losing any data. Absolutely. Right. Yeah, sure. And there is a standard. And as far as I can tell, you're not going to, you might lose some non-standard weird data stuff, but mm -hmm. most of, I haven't found anything yet that doesn't get copied. Actually, some of the stuff I wish it wouldn't get copied because I've had, I have now thousands of names right. in my address book and and there's notes from tools that I used back when. Yep. That's why for me, I end up, when I do log into these new internet accounts, I almost always just limit it to the calendars. I turn, because yeah. there are check boxes for everything. So you yeah. can say, I want you to sync my calendar. Don't sync the notes that I have there. Don't sync the contacts that I have there. Because I've got all that stuff figured out. So yes, it sounds like what we need to do is sort of get it going across the system and that might be why that calendar isn't showing up there on the Mac or on I the I didn't iPhone. know you could make a default. I think that might be really the solution. Just yeah. say, this is the one that I, I have one. Counts. I have one more question, may not be related, may be related. She also had an issue with, and it seems like there's some sort of uh, commonality out there where after some Mac update 16, everybody started losing their contacts. What do you know about that? So this is yet again, uh, when I have had folks tell me that they lost their contacts, uh, it ended up being that they had, it had changed and shifted in the system to where the contacts were not the, the default contacts. I'm trying to see, don't show my screen just yet. I'm trying to see if I can, uh, get to this without having my contacts appear. Okay. So, uh, you can show my screen now. Um, you, I have the contacts app downsized, but normally it would be on the screen. So I've got the button contacts in the top. I choose settings. And then here in general, down at the bottom, once again, default account. And that is where I could choose between the different accounts I have. Make sure it's set for the account that has the actual uh, contacts that you have. If you have been up to this point, always creating your contacts in your Google account, you know, at gmail.com, then that's what you want to have is that a v default account. If you've been creating them on your iPhone, then it's probably that the iCloud account needs to be set as the default. That is going to make sure that that is what appears in that contacts app. This is the other gripe that I have. Apple tries to, in some ways, simplify the uh, way that these apps appear on the screen. And in doing so, they kind of hide some of these menus that aren't showing you the full context that some of those contacts Always aren't showing. Always problematic. That's, yeah. that's the balance Apple has of making it easy for everybody, but then hiding and sometimes confusing. Confusing in, in uh, hiding that People away. by hiding things, yeah. Cool. Um, Did you get all that, Tammy? <laughs> <laughs> She's in the other room. So thank you. Yeah, Appreciate of course. It. And uh, can always follow up. Ask the tech guys at twit.tv uh, to let us know if you're Appreciate still it. struggling. Yeah. Cool. Okay, everybody to say you. bye, Tammy. Bye, bye Tammy. Tammy. <laughs> <laughs> we, I, I just show, you can show, I've taken uh, all the personal stuff out. This is the web-based fast mail uh, calendar, which honestly works just fine. Mm -hmm. I think in, in, in some ways it might be better to just use the web as you probably do for email already, yeah. Uh, just use the web for your uh, uh, calendar uh, and contacts. You'd eliminate all of these problems. Uh, this is completely capable. It does all the things uh, that you'd want it to do. Um, you see I have, you could continue to show this. You'd see I have uh, a variety of calendars I can turn off and on. Um, so if I want to see Lisa's calendars, I could turn it on. I usually leave it off because she's much busier than I am in it fills my calendar with stuff I don't have to worry about. I've synced up to TripIt, which is a the travel site I use. Uh, by subscribing to that, it automatically puts in any travel plans so that I don't even have to manually enter those at all. Um, you see, I also have events. This is kind of an, I, I don't know if I recommend this or not. It's a subscription service called Forecast with a K. And uh, it 
it's a kind of a, a, a how should I, it's like a consumer driven um, calendar app where people can put events in. So if you go to forecast, you'll see it's oh, got all sorts of, and I, yeah. I like to keep track of this stuff partly because of the show, like it's Oprah's birthday. Uh, happy birthday, Lisa and Oprah. I could see the championship game uh, is coming up uh, between the Bengals and the Chiefs. I see it's World Puzzle Day. What's it called, the site? Forecast with a K. That's cool. And you can add, uh, you can add your, uh, your events to it. So it's got a lot of events in it. I wish it were free because it really is kind of like IMDB or Wikipedia where people are contributing it. Um, I don't know if it's worth spending 10 bucks a month for something like this. I must be grandfathered in on an older plan. Um, but because uh, I can't believe 100 bucks a month. That's crazy. <coughs> Excuse me. But I do love the idea of having, uh, you know, having my calendars kind of all in there. Uh, and I can use that to, you know, when it's hot dog day, national hot dog day, I can, uh, <laughs> I can celebrate with you. Yeah. Celebrate with you. That's really cool. Let's take uh, some more calls, shall we? Or uh, should I take a walk? Maybe I'll take a hike. You're going to take a hike? I'm going to take a hike. All right. I don't know. Uh, I don't know how this is going to work out because uh, I don't, there's not really that much to say about it, but I thought I'd show you this new Amazon uh, Echo. Yeah. I'm it's excited. It's a little pricey. Uh, that's the only negative. Although they occasionally have sales. Let me. Let me disconnect and walk off. Yeah, particularly uh, Black Friday and uh, an end of the year uh, sales on these devices and typically when new versions come out, I think around September, uh, they'll also have some sales on them. So I told you the story. I wanted to get something for my mom that made it easier for her to do video calls. And uh, and I thought, you know, she loves her Echo. She, <laughs> she uses it to, when she turns on the shower to, to remind her that she turned on the shower for hot water and so she says remind me to check the shower in 20 seconds <laughs> things like that because she doesn't want to walk away and forget she does she says remind me to take my my medications uh things like that so she's got a good relationship with her amazon echo the other day she said oh it seems to be dying i said well unplug and plug it in again but then i thought you know i'm going to send her a new one anyway this is one of the higher priced echo shows and it has a couple of interesting features first of all that's a big old subwoofer the speaker on this is really quite good mm -hmm. so she gets to hear some pretty darn good music she likes to listen to music it also has a fairly large uh, screen and another thing i did is i i kept it on my amazon account you know when you buy one of these it's automatically set up for your account you can there's a little checkbox hidden away to say don't associate with my account that's probably a good idea if you're going to give it as a gift uh but i knew that mom wouldn't remember her amazon login <laughs> and there was another reason i did that because i have taken all the family slides we have about a thousand photos from when i was a kid and mom was young and I had digitized them. My sister did this some years ago. And I put them all on Amazon Photos and made the photo album that she gets. And she was so pleased because all of a sudden she's seeing pictures. When you're 90 years old, it's good to see pictures from the good old days. She loves this. And this just, just, just shows those pictures, which is great. Actually, this is an old picture from my good old days. Uh, of my wife Lisa, her son Michael, and I think we're uh, we're in Japan at the hotel there. So that's kind of fun, and 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 you know it does this continuous slideshow. So uh, you know she says, wait, 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 I want to see that picture again. I said, Mom, you just slide. She, I said, don't worry about Mom. There'll be it'll, <laughs> it'll be, come back. It'll come back in about. <laughs> There's a thousand pictures in about ten years. <laughs> but there's another interesting thing this does. It follows you around. So this Echo is on a swiveling base uh now this is what you're paying a lot of money for is this Motor, swiveling base yeah. it is uh list is 200 i got it for 150 they have a lot of sales so keep your eye peeled i'm sure there'll be prime day and black friday sales but this thing swivels around it's a little creepy now you got to put it somewhere <laughs> where it can see all the way around in fact when you get it it will ship with a paper template that you can put down to make sure it's going to go somewhere. It really? Could, yeah. That's so funny. It can swivel all around. We have a, a, a like a little bit of a raised shelf in our great room, which is the kitchen, the dining room, and the living room. It's all one big room. And we have a little shelf that's almost exactly in the middle. It's perfect for this. And as I when I say, uh, oh, I didn't change the wake word. Okay, so we're going to. I'm, I don't want to wake up your Amazon, everybody. Oh, so can we? Do you have a mute button there for you? Stomp button. 
Okay, ready? Whoa, <laughs> it, it turns around. It sees you? where you are. Okay, maybe that is a little scary. And I it, wasn't expecting that. <laughs> <laughs> it, it call, it, and as you walk around on a call, it follows you around. And I thought, this would be great for mom. She doesn't have to think about it. She just says, you know, the word. Wait a minute, let me mute me again because I'm going to change his name. Now, oh. that's interesting. I didn't know that. I didn't know that That's either. a limitation of this particular Echo show is changing the... It's, I tried to change your name. She said it's not supported on this device. I'm not sure why that is. But anyway, I thought there's not much more to say about it. It is better uh, audio quality. It's really great audio quality, which is nice. Mom has it in her bedroom right next to her bed. She can listen to music or ocean sounds when she goes to sleep, that kind of thing. Uh, and, and she could do it with her voice. Most importantly, my sister, who lives just a few blocks away, mom's in Rhode Island, so I can't get to her very quickly. But my sister, fortunately, lives just a few blocks away. I got her one of these as well. And we all have the same, we all have, and I put a little post-it note on mom's that says, if you want to talk to your son, say, and I, I gave her the name. There's a couple of different names. I said, you say, call Laporte Kitchen, which is actually the name of this one. Uh, or you could say, call Leo's office. And she can remember that. And I have a name for hers. And I could say, call mom. And so that way, she doesn't have to remember much. She can simply say, you know, call mom. There are additional, <laughs> here's a good picture of uh, the birthday girl. There are <laughs> in, her, in her 49ers colors. Uh, there are additional features for seniors that are really, really great. And if you have a senior parent uh, or a senior in your family that you want to have uh, take advantage of this. I would check into the those features because there's a lot of other things it can do. It can monitor. It can uh, it can listen for sounds. Now they can listen for glass breaking or falling. She can call nine one one with her voice. She can call for help. So there's a lot of great things. I think for a senior, this is a really great thing. And because it turns when you talk to it, it almost feels alive. Yeah. And there's something about that. It could be some people would find this creepy. My mom is actually likes it. It's if, I could see it being kind of yeah. It's it's uh it, it it makes you feel like there's a person there with you almost. Well, and as as we talk more and more on this, and we 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 have at least a weekly call on this thing, she sees me in this thing. It's become kind of a proxy for me. So if it follows her around, if it talks to her, she doesn't think of it as a robot or even Amazon, she thinks of it as, as kind of a, almost her family, mm -hmm. family members. My sister and I use this to talk with her on it. Uh, I think this is a really amazing tool for people with limited mobility, for elders, for people who have other disabilities that make it difficult for them, for instance, to type, uh, using your voice. I hope, I know we know Amazon has lost a lot of money on this product. Uh, I think that's too bad because I really think this is a really great product. This is the most expensive Echo you can get. Can you pull that up on uh, Amazon, um, somebody, so that we can uh, show you the listing? I don't know why the price goes up and down as it does. That's that's pretty Amazon for you. I wouldn't buy it at uh, two hundred dollars, but if it comes down to uh, one hundred fifty bucks, I think it's a, a really great uh, a really great little device. And I will look into why it says it can. I can only call it the A word. That seems yeah. Sick. I didn't. I didn't realize that. that. Seems odd. It, it could be that the oh yeah. Look at that. Two forty nine. Do not get it. This is the, this is the most expensive tenth generation. There's one other negative. It's minor, but I don't like it. This is the black one. You saw it comes in black and white. Mm -hmm. Even when you get the black one, you get a white cord. Oh, what's the point, right? That's how hard would it be to give me a black power cord? I ask you. Doesn't bother me that much, but, but if you're OCD, I want you to know, and I know we have a lot of people for whom that would be annoying. Uh, that's one more thing. All right, I'm going to walk back. That's the little tour of the uh, Amazon 10th generation. Very cool. Echo Show. Uh, you can follow me as I walk around. It learns who you are. It knows your voice. It's almost like a little little pet, a little pal. In your... Hey, everybody. Leo Laporte here. I am the founder and one of the hosts at the Twit Podcast Network. I want to talk to you a little bit about what we do here at Twit because I think it's unique, and I think for anybody who is uh, bringing a product or a service to a tech audience, 
You need to know about what we do here at Twit. We've built an amazing audience of engaged, intelligent, affluent listeners who listen to us and trust us when we recommend a product. Our mission statement as Twit is to build a highly engaged community of tech enthusiasts. Boy, already you should be your ears should be perking up at that because highly engaged is good for you. Tech enthusiasts, if that's who you're looking for, this is the place. We do it by offering them the knowledge they need to understand and use technology in today's world. And I hear from our audience all the time, part of that knowledge comes from our advertisers. We are very careful. We pick advertisers with great products, great services, with integrity, and introduce them to our audience with authenticity uh, and genuine enthusiasm. And that makes our host red ads different from anything else you can buy. We are literally bringing you to the attention of our audience and giving you a big fat endorsement. We like to create partnerships with trusted brands, brands who are in it for the long run, long term partners that want to grow with us. And we have so many great success stories. Tim Broom, who founded IT Pro TV in 2013, started advertising with us on day one, has been with us ever since. He said, quote, we would not be where we are today without the Twit Network. I think the proof is in the pudding. Advertisers like IT Pro TV and Audible that have been with us for more than 10 years, they stick around because their ads work. And honestly, isn't that why you're buying advertising? You get a lot with Twit. We have a very full service attitude. We almost think of it as kind of artisanal uh, advertising, boutique advertising. You'll get a full service continuity team. People who are on the phone with you, who are in touch with you, who support you from with everything from copywriting to graphic design. So you are not alone in this. We embed our ads into the shows. They're not... They're not added later. They're part of the shows. In fact, often they're such a part of our shows that our other hosts will chime in on the ad saying, yeah, I love that. Or just the other day, <laughs> one of our hosts said, man, I really got to buy that. <laughs> That's an additional benefit to you because you're hearing people, our audience trusts saying, yeah, that sounds great. Uh, we deliver, always over deliver on impressions. So you know you're going to get the impressions you expect. The ads are unique every time. We don't pre record them and roll them in. We are genuinely doing those ads in the middle of the show. Uh, we'll give you great onboarding services. Ad tech with pod sites that's free for direct clients gives you a lot of reporting, gives you a great idea of how well your ads are working. You'll get courtesy commercials. You actually can take our ads and share them across social media and landing pages. That really extends the reach. There are other free goodies too, including mentions in our weekly newsletter that's sent to thousands of fans, engaged fans who really want to see this stuff. We give you bonus ads and social media promotion too. So if you want to be a long-term partner, introduce your product to a savvy, engaged tech audience. Visit twit.tv slash advertise. Check out those testimonials. Mark McCrary is the CEO of Authentic. You probably know him, one of the biggest uh, original podcast advertising companies. We've been with him for 16 years. Mark said the feedback from many advertisers over 16 years across a range of product categories everything from razors to computers, is that if ads and podcasts are going to work for a brand, they're going to work on Twitch shows. I'm very proud of what we do because it's honest, it's got integrity, it's authentic, and it really is a great introduction to our audience of your brand. Our listeners are smart, they're engaged, they're tech savvy, they're dedicated to our network, and that's one of the reasons... We only work with high integrity partners that we've personally and thoroughly vetted. I have absolute approval on everybody. If you've got a great product, I want to hear from you. Elevate your brand by reaching out today at advertise at twit.tv. Break out of the advertising norm. Grow your brand with host red ads on twit.tv. Visit twit.tv slash advertise for more details. Or you can email us advertise at twit.tv if you're ready to launch your campaign now. I can't wait to see your product. So give us a ring. I'm ready for another uh, call. Are you? Yeah, let's do another call. All right. Raise your hand. Nobody's got their hands right. Wait a minute. That's that's wrong. Some people do. Let's go to Richard. Richard's got his hand raised. Richard, you're going to get an invitation. Click OK as soon as you see that. And uh, 
you will join us in the on air. Did studio. you hit that second button? Oh, doi. I got to remember it. I got two buttons. There it goes, Richard. Now you're going to see that little pop up before you. The two buttons. The two buttons. Two buttons. <laughs> but two buttons. Unmute your mic. Debutant. Turn on your camera if you wish. Hello. Hello, Richard. Hello. Can you hear me? I hear yes, you great. Welcome. We Hello, and uh, welcome from Rochester, New York, where it's uh, raining instead of snowing. Yeah. It's January, doesn't it? No. <laughs> oh, well. Well, as long as it stays like this, I'll like it. <laughs> yeah, yeah I bet. I know up north uh, in uh, New York State, you can have snow all winter and get six or seven feet in the long run and so forth. You're not yeah, that far Buffalo north. Buffalo got so. it big. Yeah. Course. Yeah, Buffalo, it's tough. What can we do for you? Well, my question is a Windows 10 question. When I plug a fob into my computer, whether it's a small fob or a external drive looking in window or a uh, file explorer mm -hmm. on the side panel there it shows like five different drives um and the only one i can click is the bottom one that tells me what my files are in that fob so, in that so instead drive. of just one drive showing up when you plug in a usb device or at least this particular USB device, you're seeing several of them when you go to this PC. You see yes, several and devices. It shows more, yes, and it shows on several devices or yeah. several drives, not just the one that I'm plugging in. So this is not uncommon. A lot of USB devices are, are partitioned, and you're seeing all the partitions. Generally, uh, only one of them is important. Where do these, what do these drives come from? Where do they come from? It's just drives that I've purchased or whatever. Okay. Um, they aren't partitioned by me at all. Yeah, yeah, no, they come that way. Yeah, yeah. Uh, usually only no, one partition matters. They're all named the same thing? Yes. No, there's the, the, the some of them don't show the name at all, but the last one might show the name of that drive that I called it. One thing you can do if you're curious is uh, open up the disk management interface uh, if you do Windows key X and choose disk management. And that's where you're going to see what's going on with those drives, not just the names, but you'll see how they're partitioned. And furthermore, you'll see uh, probably from looking at it which partition you're going to care about. It may be, you know, yeah. some, some drives are sold with multiple drive formats. You know, one for a Mac, one for Windows. But more often, there's four or five small, tiny partitions, uh, f you know, there for technical reasons, and one main storage partition that is 99% of the storage. And that's obviously the one you care about. I'm sorry. And I have gone in to look at that, and it only shows one partition. Oh. One oh. drive. That's it. It doesn't show any so other So it's not drive. partitioned, but you're seeing five different names and these only show up after you've plugged in the device they're not those other random drives are not there when you don't have something plugged in that is correct they're there once i unplug it or say disconnect it 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 shuts off is and there anything on those uh, drives right now that you care about uh i have also pulled everything off okay reformatted the drive and put it back in again and still the same still the yeah. same problem so I, I wouldn't do this unless you don't need anything on that drive. But go again into Disk Manager and just delete those extra letters. It just has, for some reason, has multiple letters associated with the same drive. The only problem is, is I don't see any other drives connected when I'm in that Disk Manager. It shows the one that I can see that I can look in, but I don't see where... The other ones are to be able to delete all the other ones. That's interesting. And actually, that worries me a little bit. Did you buy these on Amazon? That was my concern, too. Well, I've, I've had these drives for over five years. Okay. There is a scam. It's going on right now on Amazon where where they uh, they sell a drive as a 16-terabyte drive, but it, it really isn't. It's just got some firmware that's lying to the operating system. And it's got a little tiny uh, TF card in there, a little micro uh, USB card in there that has maybe a terabyte on it or maybe even less. Um, 
and so you got to be very careful. Amazon sometimes even will uh, promote these as Amazon's choice. Uh, they're not. <laughs> they're third-party sellers. Sometimes it even says sold by and shipped from Amazon. It's That's not enough. If it's $100 for 16 terabytes, th that's enough to tell you that it's not a 16 terabyte drive. It's too good. So I was worried that maybe you had one of those. Sometimes those drives do show up f kind of funny. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm worried a little bit about what's going on on that drive. Uh, it's more than one, huh? And you've had it for a while. Yeah, it's, it's several. It's three different drives I can plug in, and that happens. And you mentioned yeah. you. this was a Windows 10 question. Does that mean that in previous versions of Windows, you did not have this issue? It, it didn't crop no, up until I, you updated? No, I, I, I've i had Windows 10 for a little while, and this was working okay we'll say a month ago okay. I, I would, plug I, drive would in and it, I would it would only show one i you know so there's two different things you can do to a drive you said you reformatted it but that doesn't change the part underlying partitioning information i'd repartition it i just you say you don't see any you just see one partition i would delete that partition make sure there's no other partitions on there create a whole new partition table it may be a, a, a munged up partition table and it actually if that's the case you don't want to keep using it because eventually you're going to lose data. It's it, the partition table does not match the actual physical hard drive. So I would delete any partition information, create a new partition on that drive, format that partition. Now it showed it should show up only as a single drive, and it, and you should be able to use it safely. Um, but now I, that's the same situation though happens on more than one drive. Yeah, it's the, not just this one. Drive yeah, that's, that's the question: doing. is why this is happening. That's why I'm wondering about you know if there if it's master boot record versus GUID partition table, then you've got a situation where maybe this this version of Windows 10, you know, update was installed that lets you. It's, very it's, odd. it's getting confused about the partition tables yeah. that are installed, um, and I don't know. I personally don't know how to change those between MBR and GPT on uh, on a Windows machine. Uh, you didn't find these in the fast. parking lot, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, not at all. Okay. And how no. big how big are these drives? Uh, a normal small drive. It just has a bunch of PDFs on it. It's, okay. it's nothing stuff that I've scanned. You remember in the old like days, uh, early days of Windows, it couldn't handle more than two gigabyte uh, drives. So they would partition anything bigger than two gigabytes into multiple uh, partitions. Um, there were all sorts of I think things. The we smaller ones that I have are like two. Yeah, um, I, it's puzzle. It's a puzzlement. Uh, it, and honestly, I don't like the idea of there being hidden partitions on a drive. That sounds suspicious to me. Maybe it was for technical reasons the manufacturer did that. The fact is that they're showing. They they were always there. I would guess they're only now showing up because Windows 11 is giving you more information about that drive. Um, maybe I'm doing something wrong in disk manager. I, I, I don't, I guess I don't know much about that to understand what I might delete or change. Well, you can see, and that's why disk manager is, is important. You can see on my PC here, I only see one drive. It's a C drive. But if I look at disk pit, uh, the disk manager, I actually have two drives on here. Uh, one is unused which is good to know. I didn't know that. So I'm going to have to format that and start using it. But you can, <laughs> but the disk partitioner is the, is the single source of soul of uh, source of truth here. So file Explorer is going to tell you what you, what it, what you, you know, you as the end user want to see disk management. And again, you get to that, you hit show my uh, screen again, you hit windows key X uh, or right click on the start menu and you go to disk management and that's going to open this up. This is the this is the real source of truth about what's in there and what it's seeing. And you can see actually, even though there's two physical drives, there are there are a number of partitions. There's five partitions, including one unallocated terabyte. Which now that I know I have it, I'm going to format <laughs> wow, and use. Wow, terabyte! Used. <laughs> Somebody snuck a drive in here. <laughs> I'm always concerned though when you say, "Oh, you know, Explorer is not showing." Uh, or is showing something that's not there, that's cause for concern. Um, it could just be an error. It could be there's a technical reason the manufacturer did that, but it also could be malware. So we really want to get rid of those partitions in in disk management. Delete everything. I mean everything. Bear, 
bare bare bones. So you'll see when I click on a a partition on this drive and I click the red X, it's now going to. It says it's not created by Windows. It might contain data by other operating systems. You want to delete this partition? Hell yeah. Hells yeah. So I'm going to delete that partition. It's going to go away. Now I should have, oh, without the, cannot delete a protected partition without the force protected parameters set. So this is obviously, it's such a small partition. It's 498 megabytes. It's obviously something for the operating system. So I'm, I'm going to, you know, not delve deeper. You can also get the properties on this, see a little bit more uh, about it, the manufacturer. Um, I would I would dig deeper into this. A uh, number of people in our chat room are saying boot into Linux. <laughs> and you, well, there's a reason why Linux is going to be agnostic in this. Windows is going to be doing stuff with it, thinking yep. it's a Windows drive. Linux is just going to, if you launch GParted, which is their version of disk management, the partition editor. I've had um, to do that exact thing with some drives that were being yeah. weird. And you just Linux. say, no, 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 yeah. I'm the boss. I'm the captain. Get rid of all those extra partitions. I don't think you'll break the drive. Uh, and I think you'll probably make it more uh, reliable. Um, I don't I know. Don't I don't know without looking yeah, I, at that. I did have, I sent is. a link to our producer who will include in the show notes, a really great walkthrough of disk manager from oh, Microsoft itself. It's nice. got lots of screenshots for you, lots of steps. It's a great so tool. Check really. that out and it'll help you. Uh, so you can do some little, you know, tests and things to see what's going on there. For a long time, we had right. to buy partition magic or some other tool because windows wouldn't really give us good access to the partitioner. They do now. So I think it's it's worth uh, taking advantage of this. Uh, it should be able to tell you, dig a little deeper with properties, something about what's going on. It's either an error, in which case you want to fix it, or it could be, you know, as, as uh, people, everybody's pointing out, oh, that 498 megabyte partition, that's the hidden Windows system recovery partition. And you're right, I don't want to get rid of that because that makes it easy to restore Windows on here. But the, all of that, also. yeah, all of that you should be able to figure out. Yeah, check the website. I think disk management is a very good tool, and you should be able to figure out something. Hey, I appreciate all your right, call. Appreciate yeah. Nice to talk Thank to you. you. A perplexing problem. Have a great day. Stay warm in Rochester, home of Eastman Kodak. Nice. That's one bad habit you get from doing radio for years, <laughs> is you've got one line about every town in the country. Yeah. <laughs> Did you notice that? Yeah, Did you pick nice. up on that? Let's say hi to Taylor. Taylor's uh, been hanging on very patiently. Uh, let me push that button, push that button. Now, Taylor, you should push your button and uh, unmute, and you should be in our uh, in our uh, Slack or whatever it is, Zoom, and talking to us. Yeah, I think it's all right. He's still muted. There we go. Hi, Taylor. So, Leo, speaking of radio, how many times have you out -cued on this new show out of, out of force of habit? Uh, I, you know what? I, I wish I could because one of the things I realized, as I've mentioned before, there were 19 minutes of commercials on the, uh, the premier radio show, on the Tech Guy show, and I wish we could take a break every eight minutes. <laughs> <laughs> we, we can't. So we just keep on going. Taylor, it's great to talk to you again. Where are you calling from? Uh, Cincinnati, Ohio. You actually helped me years ago i have a lpfm here in cincinnati and i asked you a few things about it several times on the radio I show remember are you still doing it yeah yeah uh it's been up now shoot nine years wow. station's been on the air low that stands for strong. low low power fm which is funny the fcc gives and takes they offered that license for a long time for free and you could do it obviously you took advantage of it last time i checked mm -hmm. they had stopped temporarily i don't know and they're going to start again or i don't know it comes and goes but if you can get it it's it great it seems about once a decade they open it up <laughs> or if that you know what i mean yeah, like, it's, very it's, strange. Very, it's very rare yeah yeah but the so, idea is so, to let communities create inexpensively create fm stations that are just to serve that narrow community it only goes a few miles Oh, yeah. Ours goes, I think, five to ten mile radius yeah. at the most. I mean, but do you have listeners? It just covers... Do you hear from people? Oh, yeah. I mean, if I put a call to action out there, I get a response. That's awesome. <laughs> if, if, if I'm on a site somewhere, I get comments constantly. That's great. Uh, Neat. About it. What do you, what do you, so what kind neat. of music do you play? So uh, we're predominantly 80s, but we cover anything from the 60s to the early 90s. And you must you must automate it, right? You're not sitting there spinning discs. N oh no, it's it's so I have it fully automated. It's automated yes. across three computers. Wow. Uh, we use a software called Station Playlist, 
Uh, we categorized everything. Um, we wrote scripts. Uh, it creates today's logs and everything automatically. It pulls in weather and other information in real time and puts Neat. it on the air and mixes it. Uh, so we can do a lot of things. Uh, the most recent success is we partnered up with a local uh, university and we're broadcasting their football and sporting events. Oh, isn't so. that cool? That's like so, yeah. real radio. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's the real deal, <laughs> so, man. So if you ever want to get a taste of it again, Leo, the door is always open, my That's friend. That's really fun. <laughs> so how do you pay the license fee for the music? So um, since so the organization I have is a nonprofit, and since we're a secondary service and low power FM and a nonprofit, the royalty companies give it to us at a flat rate. So um, essentially, they take how many possible listeners mm -hmm. uh, our covers can have, and then they give us a flat discounted rate for the coverage. Nice. Now, for like streaming, we'll go through like Live 365 where royalties are covered in the subscription. Right, mm. right. So we don't have to worry about it that way. Nice. Um, where can people so, yeah, find you if they're in the, within that 10 mile radius in Cincinnati? <laughs> uh, uh, it's on the web at z98fm.com. Oh. And then it's on the radio dial at 98.1 FM. 98.1. See, that's kind of fun. So, you, you know, I mean, nowadays everybody can stream over the internet. So uh, yeah. there are plenty of internet radio stations, but I like the idea of, do you, do you have a transmitter, uh, uh -huh. mast, a, a, a tower? Uh-huh, uh, 40 foot high. Uh, That's how you get 10 uh, miles. That's great. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And then we're before TuneIn shut down their listings, we're listed on TuneIn, so we're grandfathered. Nice. Before TuneIn shut that down. Very nice. So anyway, the reason why I'm reaching out today is just like all of us, we have relatives who are getting older uh, grandma, grandparents, etc., And I am looking kind of with the exception of getting good at describing what to do. <laughs> uh, I'm looking for a way to help grandma with her phone and her iPad. Mm -hmm. Is there, I mean, I know Apple keeps things pretty locked down. Is there any tools that you guys have come across to help you know, family, friends, et cetera. I mean, you mean you want I, remote, you want remote access? Is that what you want to do or pretty much? I mean, yeah. I, I'm, I work in the MSP world or the managed service provider world. That's what I do for a living. Mm -hmm. So I'm familiar with a whole bunch of tools, but I've not found a good one. In the phone, you said with, phone for grandma. Phone is iPhone for grandma. I don't think iPhone. Is there yeah. any remote access for phone? So there are some technologies that are available, but what I'm going to suggest is something that I just used the other day. Uh, I, my mom was having an issue and FaceTime recently added the ability to share your screen. So okay. I just placed a FaceTime call oh, to my mom. Idea. I said, mom, share your screen. She shared her screen. I said, okay, you see there on the right, you're going to tap that. And then you're going to go here. Mm -hmm. Oh, I see what that looks like. Oh, tap that, tap this. Um, and that worked exactly as I needed it to. And so what I ended up doing was before the call started, I went on my phone, swiped down to get to control center, uh, tapped to record my screen with the microphone turned on, and then I showed a uh, FaceTime call and I said, here is how you tap to find that share the screen button. So then she was already prepared when it came time to do the FaceTime call. She didn't have to go looking and try to find where that button was. So I send that video out first to her. She knows now what button to press. Suddenly the screen is showing up and then I'm able to walk her through those steps and see live what's happening. So it's not the same, of course, as being able to tap on the person's screen yourself. Um, right. Apple's own support team can do that, uh, which I wish that, you know, there was a way for us to access that through um, their system. Uh, but there are some third party tools that, uh, that exist. I, yeah, TeamViewer is the one that... Um, yeah, Scooter X sent us an interesting article from uh, Helpwire, which makes one of the programs uh, that does this best software for remote iPhone support in 2023. We'll put a link in the show notes uh, to that for you, Taylor. This is the Helpwire program, which is interesting. It does It does kind of a... It's a wild way of doing it. All of these but are so expensive. Since that's you're... In, yeah, that's probably part of the problem. These are. This is for you know, tech support, uh, for a company. Right. 
Uh, TeamViewer, I think, has a free version. This it is does. ISL. You end up having Lite. to install profiles, though. It, like those are the reasons yeah, why. Yeah, they moder Yeah, that makes sense. Though they really modify the phone. Yeah, yeah. that's why I think the uh, screen sharing feature that Apple finally added is going to be the best thing that you can do because the person hears everything, you're seeing their screen. So as long as the connection is good, then there's no problem uh, with using it, that. Is Grandma physically distant? Like mine, mom is. Uh, uh, well, I'm in Ohio. She's just across the river in Kentucky. Oh, so okay. I mean, it's a 20 minute drive to get to her. It's, it's just one of those things. Yeah, it's uh, easier. You know, when when, yeah. when the phone call comes in at random hours, you know, it save myself a little bit of a trip. You know, yeah. I, I I love grandma, but save myself a little bit of a trip of jumping in the car and driving across the bridge. You know what I mean? Just for for a simple walkthrough. Kind of and you can't do, kind of you can't, you things. have no plausible deniability. Your business is IT. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Exactly. How to solve it. <laughs> you can't, exactly. You can't say, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> no, I can't. I, I, well, I, that's with all family and friends who call me. Yeah, well, you know, I, you're stuck. I can't deny any of it. It's I, like I, being a doctor, right? I, I, yeah, exactly. My wife Can is always asking this? me for help, and, and I say, I, I don't know. She says, you're the tech guy. You're supposed to know this stuff. I said, oh, all right. Oh, <laughs> I guess I right. do know. Okay. A lot of times the answers aren't satisfactory. You know, there ought to be a better way. Is, right, is, right, uh, right. Common. Right. Yeah. But um, I, I really, I found that the screen sharing thing is quite good. Um, the it, the only cool. limitation you have is just to not be able to press the button for them. So not, I, and I think that what's super important about this is whenever we think about uh, how people learn moving right. through the motions themselves is what helps teach them. So you tapping on the screen every time is not as good as them being able to do it themselves and sort of build in that muscle memory, build in that understanding now of how we get to different menus on the screen. So I, there, there's an argument that it's even better that grandma's tapping instead of you. Although you should yeah, tell well, grandma that you're going to be pretty tied up uh, in about two and a half hours for the rest of the evening, because I think Cincinnati has a football game coming. Oh yeah, yes. I I, I hope I hope to uh, be versing your wife's favorite team in the Super Bowl. Let's Wouldn't that be that fun? Way. We've played the Bengals a couple of times in the Super Bowl. That would be so much fun. So yeah. So th <laughs> thanks, guys. Uh, I I appreciate it. And Micah, you make an excellent point. And I think me just being able to see her screen on what she's doing. Will, will help a lot because yeah. sometimes it's hard to describe what to do next exactly if i you can't don't know. see what she's doing it right yep. exactly i do i do the poor man's version of that i say mom hold your phone up <laughs> to the camera that's what i did with my grandma before yeah yeah i was doing that with the uh, echo as i was he helping her set that up she was on her well, iphone and i <laughs> and i'd say mom show, show me that what's on the screen on the echo show me and she would just hold the phone up like this, and I say, "No, no, mom, I'm looking at you." <laughs> Turn it around. Turn it around. <laughs> and then she was, but we it worked. It works. It works. I did. I will tell you. But, I we that's what I used to do before this screen sharing feature <laughs> happened, and I started to get nauseated because I had it on an i I had it on a big old iPad, and so then the, the whole thing's going. Ooh, ooh. It's like well, actually, well, you need to pause. <laughs> I do. That. I do that with grandma when it comes to helping her with the TV. Yeah. She does Same that. Same thing. But, Same thing. But when she's using the remote control, the camera slides down. Uh -huh. And I'm like, you, my guy, I get nauseated. And I'm like, oh, okay, I'm falling. Now, now come back up. Now I'm falling again. You know? So, yeah. It's funny. Yeah. Hey, it's Taylor, funny. always a pleasure talking to you. I'm glad you found your way to the new Tech Guys show. We really appreciate it and hope you'll keep listening. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Just renewed uh the yearly club tour. Oh, thank you. Well, we'll see you in the Discord <laughs> in that case. Nice. All right. Thanks, Taylor. Thanks, guys. We appreciate it. Yeah, we have a lot of MSPs, uh, managed service providers, uh, who listen to our stuff. They're basically the uh, contract IT folks for a mm -hmm. lot of companies. We use uh, Russell's a managed service provider. That's what our IT guy is a, is a contractor, not a... We've tried to hire him about a thousand times. And he says, I don't want to work for you. <laughs> oh, although I notice... He's always here on free lunch Wednesday. Do you notice that? He's timed his visits very carefully, very cleverly, very smart. We have some videos, right? Do uh, you want to play a couple of those uh, videos for we us, do. John Ashley? Let's, uh, let's do the first one, which is uh, the short, shorter one uh, first. 
Hey, Ron Lewis calling from suburban Chicago, Illinois. I'm a Club Twit member, and I visited the old Twit studios a long time ago. And I have a very easy tech question for Leo and Micah. We'll be in San Francisco next week because my son lives there, and we're going to take a trip to uh, Napa Valley and go through Petaluma on the way. And I'm wondering if you have any restaurant recommendations. <laughs> Thanks. That's, That's a fun. first. <laughs> Uh, where do you like? Uh, no, you this is you're all not you. a foodie. You're not. Yeah, you don't like you. You don't. Uh, I don't understand it. But that, of course, look how thin he is, and look how thick I am. Husky. That's with two C's, by the way. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. You can either be thick or you can be husky. T H I C C C. We uh, we do enjoy eating out, and uh, one of the nice things about being in the wine country in Petaluma, we're in Sonoma County, is. Uh, it has become a food destination. In fact, Charlie Palmer, who is a local restaurateur, but you may know his name. He's some very famous restaurants in Las Vegas and elsewhere, is, uh, has announced he's building a 65-room uh, hotel with a Charlie Palmer restaurant in the ground floor right in the middle of downtown, where the old Chevron station used to be. You might remember that in Petaluma, oh. right on the crossroads wow. on, uh, on the main street. Uh Right now, there are a few very, very good restaurants anywhere on that Main Street. It used to be called Main Street, you know, but now it's called Petaluma Boulevard. <laughs> I like Main Street. Main Street, USA. Right there on Main Street, there's some very good restaurants. There are two of uh, our favorite Italian restaurants are there, which is uh, Cafe uh, uh, Par Parad... Now, see, I'm, I'm blanket. There's Reese BC, which I like. Yeah, Paradiso. Paradiso. Cafe Paradiso. Both of those are very good. Go a couple of blocks more, though. I think probably the best restaurant, one of the best restaurants in town, uh, is right there on the on the corner of the Boulevard and Western, and that Central Market. I highly recommend that. Uh, their chef there uh, it came from Louisiana. He's he's Ooh. New Orleans born and bred. Uh, Tony has his own pig farm. He raises his own hogs. Wow. He uh, he's really really a great chef, and I think uh, I think you'd. Really enjoy Central Market if you can get in. Watch out. There's celebrities there occasionally. You might see uh, Tom Waits comes there from time to time. Uh, another big movie star who lives just over the road in um, Bolinas uh, comes in. Just won an Oscar for uh, for that um, Nomad Land. Uh, what is her name? And I can't remember it. Anyway, you, you, I've, I've seen uh, many. Chelsea Handler was there one night. It's a very popular place. That tells you it's probably Good considered stuff, the best yeah. restaurant. For breakfast, I like uh, Cafe, uh, or rather, uh, Della Fattoria, which is across the street. They're all in that same several block area. And there's a new restaurant, which a lot of people like. It's pricey. It's one of those uh, fixed price restaurants with eight courses called Table Culture Provisions. Tiny little hole in the wall, also on the boulevard. So there's a few recommendations for you. You don't like that as much. John Ashley. <laughs> John Ashley's favorite. I know what John Ashley's favorite is because he says they have really good drinks. Is one of the newest restaurants in town. It's Southern Cooking. That's and, what it's called? No, no. So oh. they have a really good brunch. As I keep egging. I you keep to go trying over to there. get to egging? the brunch. Egging? It's a pun? Where's Kevin? The, the fried no, chicken's exactly. very good, but it's got a terrible name. I can never remember the name. Easy Rider? Oh, that is a terrible name. That's a, the worst name. Because what do you think? What do you think? Uh, I'm not going to say what you I think. You think it's a bike bar, right? That's biker bar, really, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm, that. Uh, it's not. It's actually very good southern uh, food in a northern. They call it southern cooking in northern California is what they call it. Because it quite literally is that. Yeah. So it depends what you're hankering for. But if you want a very nice adult <laughs> oh, beverage and a fried chicken, I think that's a good place. For some hominy grits. For some hominy Poor Dan is falling asleep here. I'm going to go to you, Dan. So wake. <laughs> Dan, wake up. <laughs> wake up, Dan. You don't, is it, you got your hand raised there? All right. He's got his hand raised. I'm going to push that button, put that button there. I'm going to have some, I should have brought some fried chicken today. Ooh. I keep trying to tell my wife, let's go to Popeye's. That's what wow. I want. Hey, Dan, how are you? Welcome to uh, the show, Dan. Where are you calling from? Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, terrific. I am calling actually from. A little bit overcast, uh, Kona, Hawaii. Oh, from beautiful. It, now, that's not real what's behind you, but that's probably the view out the window, right? <laughs> it, it is uh, actually uh, Kona Village, a resort that oh. uh, will be up this, this summer after being. Is it coming? Is it coming back? It's oh, my gosh. So, Kona Village, 
it was a legendary all-inclusive resort it completely remote you couldn't have a tv couldn't bring your phone where steve jobs was staying when the iphone 4 scandal happened he was oh. there with his whole family he had to fly but he didn't want to he had to fly back from kona village to tell the world you're holding it wrong <laughs> he brought his little son young son reed along with him he says i want to show you how business is done kid uh, I, I have a good friends who used to go to Kona Village regularly, and I, I never went, and I always wanted to go, and it got blown away in a hurricane about 10 years ago. So they're rebuilding it. Uh, it is. It's been under construction or, or reconstruction for three or four years now, and the intention is to be opening this, this summer. Uh, Dan, actually, I will be there the minute they open. I have all my life wanted to stay there. Because uh, Steve Jobs, the other person I know stays there is William Randolph Hearst III. <laughs> I like to go to, go, he told me it's a good place to go. So I want I want to go there. Uh, do you, are you affiliated with it in any way? Can you get me in? Uh, I, I, that's why I'm here on Island. In fact, I am I am part of the opening team uh, getting the place. Oh, wow. Uh, that's cool. Created, so. I have a friend in the business. <laughs> I'm very excited. Will it continue to be all-inclusive? Uh, it will have components that will be very similar. Uh, you know, the, it's under new ownership after being uh, out of commission for so long. And so the, the, the new company in there is spending quite a bit of money to get it back to its grandeur. Uh, so there's, there's more and more elements. You know, to be honest with you, some of the programming is still uh, under, under debate. But uh, You tell them no be... phones, no TVs. <laughs> tell you. Uh, there are no TVs. Uh, I love it. Sure. I love it. Oh, I'm so glad it's coming back. I, you know, I check the Facebook page every five years, crossing my fingers. I knew that it, you know, really got devastated by which hurricane was that? I can't remember, but you know, it was it was actually a tsunami that oh, came in, yikes. took it out, even worse. So it I, was. I know it was Damn. devastated, and uh, and that the the owners at the time just couldn't rebuild it. It was just too much to do. So I'm glad somebody it acquired is. the property. That's great, and I hope it has a. What I liked about it, or what people seemed to like about it, was the it was an authentic Polynesian experience. They tried to really be as authentic as possible. Not a big resort hotel, but just stayed in a, uh, was a Halle, and uh, I hope that they they're going to keep it kind of like that, Dan. It it is they're actually 150 individual Halle, oh. um, and we are definitely going for. Oh authenticity and genuine so we're working very closely with a lot of the lineal descendants here in hawaii that actually uh had family uh hundreds of years ago working there and living there at this village so it's a very special place to the hawaiians here especially absolutely the team. absolutely that's one of the things i just read an article that said uh you know for a while the club meds of the world the sandals of the world the all-inclusives where you were really isolated from the culture uh were popular but now millennials, when they travel, they want the culture. They want to experience. They don't want to be disconnected from the, the, the place that they are. And so there is a growing market. I'm sure you know this, Dan, uh, for uh, uh, resorts that you can go to where you could participate in the culture. And I love the Polynesian culture, not the, not the you know, the Don Ho <laughs> uh, uh, style Hawaiian culture, but I love the real a Polynesian culture uh, of Hawaii. And I, I love it that you guys are going to honor that and uh, make a place to go. When do you think you'll open next year? Uh, actually, uh, this summer. <gasps> wow. I'll be uh, giving you a little uh, call, Dan. <laughs> uh, I don't expect uh, any special treatment. I just want I know it'll be impossible to get in for the first five years. <laughs> it'll be booked up solid. What can we, what, I love it. You're reclining, Dan, in front of the beach in Kona. I'm uh -huh. so jealous. So I nice. am. I have the 49er game off, off to my right, paying attention to that. So, Well, I'm, I'm impressed that you were able, as I was, not to leap with joy minutes ago. But okay, we will, <laughs> we will pretend nothing else is going on. What's, uh, what's on your mind right now? So I'm, I'm, I don't want to be redundant, and you may have answered this question, but I know, um, you know Apple just launched their M2 16-inch MacBook Pros uh, a week or so ago. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if you've given your feedback. I don't even know if you probably haven't even gotten your hands on one. I have not. But Jason I, Snell has. He did a good review on Six Colors. And I've been so, reading 
uh, a number of reviews. Actually, the best review I read uh, just came out at Notebook Check. These guys have taken the mantle perhaps away from a non-tech mm. for the most thorough benchmark-based uh, reviews of, of all. And they did a very, very good, very thorough review of the uh, M2. And I can synopsize it for you. Not having, uh, I, we, Mike and I own the earliest M2, the, the MacBook Airs, which we're very happy Super with. Super happy with. It's Excellent my favorite battery life. Mac I've ever yeah. had, for sure. The first thing to understand, really, is that these are not going to be the same performance leap that the M1 was from Intel. You know, Now that we're in Apple Silicon, we're only going to see 10, 20% uh, jump. There is some thinking, and I, I give this some credence. In fact, it's what I've decided to do. Elisa is waiting. It's going to be her late birthday present tomorrow uh, or the next day. She'll get her 14-inch uh, MacBook Pro. Nice. She got nice. the Max. She, she got the, right, John? Do you know? Yeah, she got every, she got, how much RAM did she get, John? <laughs> she, she has no, no need for this. I was going to say, what's she going to do? She's got the most powerful computer in the house. She's got the Mac Studio max but she you know anyway i'm thrilled i get to play with it and drool over but i decided not to because i'm going to wait for the m3 this mm -hmm. rumor is and the story is on this apple's uh, a little bit stuck on that five nanometer tsmc process so the m1 and the m2 are not so very different in fact the m1 was what the a14 chip and the m2 is the a15 chip that you see in the current iphones but if all goes well and the process works, we're expecting uh, them to use the new 3 nanometer process for the M3. And that is maybe where you see these larger jumps in performance, uh, battery life, and so forth. One thing Apple did do with the M2 is they increased the number of efficiency cores. So I think we're going to see very good battery life on these. Uh, not a huge jump in performance. The GPUs did get a, a real boost. I think it's, you know, it's the same exact physical design as the M1 14 and 16 inch MacBook Pros. So you're not going to see any change in that regard. You are going to see Wi-Fi 6E. Mm -hmm. So if you have 6E, I'm sure you're going to put 6E all over Kona Village. If you had, no, do you actually, do you, you probably won't put Wi-Fi in, will you? There, I think there's probably at this day, they, they uh, have to, uh, right? going to need to have Wi-Fi. Yeah. I don't think Lisa would go if they if she couldn't you know check in <laughs> daily with the uh, the business. So yeah, good. You got to put in Wi-Fi. So 6E is the latest. F uh, and and by the way, that was one thing Notebook Check noted: a vast improvement in Wi-Fi performance on these. That's the single biggest jump, almost double the Wi-Fi performance of the M1 MacBook Pros. Otherwise, very similar. In fact, if it's because you need a laptop right now, you might look at getting a lower cost exactly. M1. Exactly. Yeah. Because you're not going to see a huge difference. It kind of depends on what you what you do. Are you an architect? Are you a designer? What what do you do, Dan? Uh, I'm actually a food and beverage guy, and that's why nice. I got the rent. So. Nice. <laughs> that's why you're relaxed. <laughs> I have I, my 10, 11 year old MacBook 17 inch has finally given up oh, the go. And, oh, and oh, you're going to be happy oh, with any. You're going to see. Yeah. it's night and day from yeah. that. Yeah, get this. You know what? I would get the 16 if you can afford it. The M2 16 might as well get the latest one. Mm -hmm. You certainly don't want to wait for next year's in M3. That would that would be crazy. So get the uh, get the you owe, you, you owe it to yourself. You've got a big job up ahead of you. So you're going to run the whole uh, food and beverage operation in there. Yes, sir. <gasps> yes, sir. Wow. I'm liking this guy more and more. I know. <laughs> I can't wait. Are they going to have a luau at Kona Village? Uh, there will be a, a luau, yes. Our Ho'okipa Grounds, actually, is what it's called, and we will have a, a, an authentic luau They'll there. do the real deal. I love that. Neat. The real and you know deal. what? I will even eat poi just for you. <laughs> <laughs> well, good. Oh, you can have mine. <laughs> <laughs> I knew it! <laughs> uh, but the pork, a luau pork, there's nothing like it. A little Kahlua pork, and that is uh, that is to die for. It's, it's that, that is definitely my favorite. Yeah. Just, so... In, in, when configuring this M2, I know there's all the, a multitude of upgrades from RAM to storage size and all that. And there was a recommended configuration when they went to the M2 MacBook Air. Is there an ideal configuration that maximizes its performance? So uh, notebook already... check. We in the earlier uh, last year's MacBooks, there was some concern about the the uh, base model 
hard drives. Mm -hmm. They weren't as fast as they possibly could be because they only used a single unit instead of dual units for the storage. And you can't, by the way, these are not upgradable in any respect. You're going to get what you get and keep it and you're going to like it. <laughs> so uh, th they did note that this year's model still has one unit for the hard drive storage, but they got a two terabyte version. They said it screamed. So it's probably the case that you would, I just would not get the lowest but you're not going to want a 256 gig or I don't know what it is. Maybe it's 512 yeah, these days. Get more storage yeah. space. That's the one I'd say thing. if you get the terabyte or better, you're going to get the performance boost. Uh, we weren't we weren't really able to to figure that out on MacBreak Weekly on Tuesday, uh, even though Jason Jason had the higher end one. He had a loner. Um, I would say, you know, you don't you probably don't need you you won't even use the highest end chip. Uh, you know, you can have an eight core CPU, 10 core GPU. I would say you can go with the base model chip and put that extra money into a little more yes, RAM. So let's spec this out right now for you. So we'll see how much you can spend. Well, this is the air though. You wanted a pro. Did I you? say air? Oh, let's go to the pros. Sorry about that. Thank you for correcting me on that. I thought that seemed, there's three yeah, models. I was like, Why is that so inexpensive? Yeah. Well, there's also three yeah, I was models say, that's pro. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That is a screaming deal and not not the deal you're going to get. They start at $2,000. So you want 16 because you had a 17. You want to go a big screen, right? Yes. Yeah. Uh, okay, now this is more like it. We see the three different configurations. Actually, is there a fourth? No, there's just three different configurations uh, of processor. 1219 or 1238. Go with the 1219. You don't need, yeah, you do not you need, don't need 38 core GPU. Uh, you're going to select that. I'd say, you know, the base the base model RAM um, is, oh, and here's, and once you're within there, you can see you can still upgrade these, but stay at the lowest end processor. I'd say, and with the lowest end, you can't go higher than 32 gigs. I would go for 32. Really? Yeah, 16 is going to be plenty, honestly. But if you're spending this kind of money yeah, on an M2 Pro... Yeah, if it's an investment that's going to last you many, many years... You kept that 17-inch for 12 years, my friend. This will I did. Yeah, those amateurs out well. I don't think you need two terabytes. That's up to you. It starts at one terabyte. I'm pretty sure that's the faster uh, uh, disk storage. So I think you're fine on that. But if you want more, you're going to have to get it because you're not going to... The uh, One thing we have learned with these uh, Apple Silicon models, because the storage is right on the motherboard... It's significantly faster than any external storage, even with Thunderbolt 4. Mm -hmm. So for a long time, we said, well, thanks to Thunderbolt 3, an external drive on a Mac, these Intel Macs could be as fast as the internal drive. That's not true anymore on this Apple Silicon. Uh, you, 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 the fastest by far storage is the storage that comes with it. So get as much as you're going to need. For instance, if you're doing a lot of video editing, as my son does, uh, you want to, you'll probably want to get two or four terabytes because you want to keep all the files that you're working on internal. You can move them off later, as Micah does with his photos, but you want to... So that's up to you how much storage you need. I don't think that's going to make any difference. That's $3,000 with a terabyte drive and 32 gigs of RAM. I think that's a good configuration. That's a pretty pricey device, but if you're going to keep it 12 years, uh, you know, that's that's a pretty good deal. We're talking about about $10 a month, $20 a month. Yeah, what is that? Two hundred fifty dollars a year. <laughs> it's less than twenty bucks a month. Yeah, I think you're pretty yeah, good, or about exactly. twenty bucks a month. That's pretty good. So amortize it out. Is it worth it to you? Uh, okay. I'm going to spend uh, your money, Dan. Yeah. If it's me, because you're going to be, uh, you know, responsible for this fine resort where the entire Twit staff is going to go next year for our offsite. <laughs> Uh, Lisa just screamed on her birthday. <laughs> uh, I think uh, I think you should absolutely get the the very finest. I don't think you need a. I guess what I'm saying is I don't think you need a Max. You probably should get a Pro. Um, that's going to be so much screaming fast. Yeah, compared absolutely. To what you got right now. That, the only thing I've ever regretted not doing was not getting more storage. So get more storage. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And read uh, you know read this notebook check review. I thought it was very useful. Or and also. For kind of a more general look at what it feels like to use it, I think uh, Jason Snell's review at Six Colors is uh, is quite good. Uh, Notebook Check said it's the best multimedia laptop. Actually, that was their M1 review uh, that they've ever uh, seen. I think their M2, they think it's uh, 
even incrementally even better. Highest, a very, very high score. I think a 94% score. So you're getting a nice machine. That's great. When does it get crazy for you? Is it crazy now or is it already? Uh... Well, the, the pre-opening of the resort is, is pretty pretty intense with, Bad. you know, saying anything and everything that you might enjoy at a resort from China glass and silverware to, to you know, the linens in the room. So it's, it's uh, you know, creating the experiences and, and dreaming up how we're going to make people um, really enjoy their visit. Well, I'm so glad Rosewood uh, came along and uh, and bought this beautiful. What is you can see the lava beach and all that. It's just it is it is old Hawaii, and I'm thrilled that they are going to keep this uh, a, as close to the original uh, as possible. And I cannot wait to stay there. I am so excited. Uh, one of our favorite <clears throat> places in uh, Hawaii is in Hana. Uh, the uh, used to be a Traversa Resort. Now I think it's a Marriott or somebody, but the uh, uh, over on Maui, going out to mm -hmm. Hana really is like going back in time. Oh, sure I, is. I'm so excited that this is opening, and uh, and and I've never been to the Big Island, so I'm very excited. This is going to be great. I can't wait. Dan, have fun. Right. Looks yes. like looks well, like you. you got a you've got a job cut out for you. What did you do? do. What did you do before this? Uh, I've been doing. Uh, hospitality resort for a while so i was in tahoe uh, at another resort uh, previously and uh, i've moved about a dozen times so i've been, been, been benefiting from the, the the career that i've been been in i've lived in some beautiful places i bet i bet kona is the most beautiful though man it, it's oh, my favorite so pretty all right hey it's great it's great to meet you expect a call <laughs> okay <laughs> thanks dan Keep i really so much i really appreciate it wow we have some great, uh, useful, uh, I mean, uh, nice listeners. Did I say useful? <laughs> nice, very nice uh, listeners. Um, did Let's see, what else did we want to do today? We're video. running out of time. Let's, should we run that last video? Run that beautiful video. Run that footage. last video. Ask the tech guys at twit.tv is the email. Send us your video questions. Hello, Leo and Micah. This is Dan in West Orange, New Jersey. My AirPods are in the wrong ears. I can see they're sticking out funny. I have funny. to reverse the ears because they don't fit. But that's not why I'm calling. <laughs> that's hysterical. My father has recently moved into assisted living. I had previously phoned you and asked you how to set up an device so that he could make phone calls using that. Uh, you also suggested using a HomePod. Well, what I found out, though, is... Be because you can only make 10 calls with the, uh, I tried to set up the HomePod only to find out that that would not work on his Wi-Fi network oh. because now he has moved into an institution and apparently institutional Wi-Fis don't allow oh. devices yeah. to interact with each other. Oh, right. So I'm right. trying to figure out how to, so I've kind of given up on the HomePod, basically. However, he also has a printer, and he can't print wirelessly from his iPad. That's what he uses as an iPad. And also, you cannot connect to that external device uh, via the Wi-Fi network in the institution. Ugh. So I'm trying to figure out a workaround so that he can print to his printer. Now, I used to have, if I can remember the name of it correctly, some Apple... Extra expresses and extremes, which are someplace in uh, storage someplace where I could create a separate network in the home mm -hmm. just for storage. printing. Yep, that's exactly what I have. So that if I wanted to, I could get on that network, print my documents, and then go back to regular Wi-Fi again. Is this possible? Is there another way of doing that besides uh, digging out my Apple Express uh, device someplace in the attic? Um, I was wondering if you could help with this. I look forward to hearing from you, and thanks for all your service. Thank you. Thank you for calling. And I really like how you've got your AirPods sticking <laughs> out. Um, wow. Uh, so a couple of things. Uh, first of all, we did bloop out when he said A-L-E-X-A because we didn't. That's that's why that sound dropped out. But he was talking about echoes. So the printer is easy to fix. So this is, um, yeah, it's unfortunate when you're in an institutional setting, you don't have full access to the Wi-Fi. Almost all printers will allow you to print direct mm -hmm. wirelessly. In effect, you're creating an ad hoc 
Wi-Fi network with the printer. So go into the printer settings and look for, I, usually it's called direct printing, yeah. where it creates direct. its own, or Wi-Fi direct, yeah, its own Wi-Fi network. And then the iPad joins that network. And I think AirPrint will work that yeah, way. Yeah, AirPrint will. That? Yeah, AirPrint okay. will work that okay. way. Okay. That would be the only question because Apple's AirPrint is kind of a... It is weird. It's uh, old thing. Yeah, it gets a little, but it, sh yeah, it should work that way. Okay, so that's the first thing. Look at the printer, Wi-Fi direct printing. Uh, if that printer doesn't do it, very few don't. You could buy a, a newer printer, which most, most certainly do it. Uh, and then, so basically, just as you kind of described, you're joining that printer's network to print. Uh, and then when you want to get back on the internet, you obviously you have to move over uh, back to the regular internet. As for the calling thing, that's one of the best features of this Echo that I got my mom. Yeah, I didn't know. What is this 10 call limit that um, he was talking about? I've never heard of this limit. Um I do know that that might be something that the carrier is imposing. I do know that Echo has decided to turn off the partnership with Verizon and AT and T, where it uses your yes. phone number to make yeah. the call. And maybe that that's how he had it set up. That's not going to be long term. That's not going to be the solution. Um, but I wonder if because. Uh, as long as you can get that echo on Wi-Fi, mm -hmm. you should be able to use drop in and the and the echo to echo calling unlimitedly. Yes. So if he was trying to call a phone number, that's probably that limitation probably is the carrier's limitation. Thank you, Skudrex. So the limitation is to 10 contacts. It's not 10 oh, calls, contacts. but 10 contacts. Oh. So I don't know if that was what you meant when, or if you maybe read that and you thought, oh, there, he's only going to be able to make 10 calls. But now that's clarified. It's 10 contacts. So yeah. if your uh, parent has more than 10 people that they want to call yeah. regularly, then it is an issue. It's it's really nice to use that echo for calling, especially for older parents who just, don't, you know, they don't want to hold a phone. They can't even dial on the phone. Yeah. Uh, it's just so easy for them to just say, you know, call Dan. I want to talk to him. And then, and that's done. Um, the, maybe the, another solution to look at, and they may or may not allow you to do this in the institution is one of the residential, uh, cellular connections offered by T-Mobile or Verizon. That's what I was thinking. Those yeah. things work surprisingly well, as long as you're near a 5g tower. Um, I've told the story before my daughter, uh, is very near, she's near the highway in uh, central California. And so she is getting 5G UC from both T-Mobile and Verizon. I'm a, I am have accounts with both. For Verizon, because I'm a Verizon customer, I was able to get for 25 bucks a month, uh, a mobile hotspot just sits in her apartment. She's gotten 150 gig, 50 megabits down, about 30 megabits up. And I was worried it might not be consistent if the tower gets busy but it's consistent day and night nice it's really a good service uh t-mobile offers something similar both of them are really trying to uh beef up their uh their customer base in fact it looks like they're really starting to beat the cable companies mm -hmm. uh cable company subscriptions are dropping dramatically and i think part of the reason is people have discovered for a lot less they can get internet from these companies so if you're lucky enough that he's lucky enough to be in a verizon or t-mobile area where he can get 5g uh, and you're already a customer, it should be fairly inexpensive. The institution may or may not allow that. That's going to be up to them. Um, I honestly think that the Echo is the best way to do this. And if you can get the Echo on the network, and it sounds like you can, I think that's really pretty much all you need. I didn't know you could make calls with the HomePod. It's basically just doing it through your phone. And, you know, it's piggybacking. Oh, it's off like a that. Bluetooth device. Yeah. Well, yeah. Ah, I it, it uses, I, uh, I believe, AirPlay, but. Okay. Uh, we uh, did buy two of the new HomePods. I'll have those for review. Oh, nice. Make a stereo pair. See how it goes. That was a, a early anniversary or late anniversary gift because they're not going to come for a couple of weeks. I guess it's a, it's actually a late Valentine's Day gift at this point. <laughs> um, but that's uh, great. Hey, we are we've 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 done a whole show. We have. We've done an entire show. Wild. How that Is there happens. anything more to say? Uh, next week we will get Alex's demonstration of Mid Journey because I think it's fun to create. Uh, AI drawings. In the meanwhile, if you've got a question, ask the tech guys at twit.tv is our email address. We love the emails, but you can also, even better, leave us a video call as those callers did. That's great. Um, keep it short if you can. 
Try to get your ear pods stuck in the right way <laughs> around so uh, it doesn't look silly. Anything else? Yeah, um, this is your last chance <gasps> to just a few more days. go to the survey and fill it out for us. Twit.tv slash survey 23. Uh, we would like to know who all of you are out there who are listening to our shows and what you think of what we're making and maybe uh, share some ideas for what could be down the road. It's also an opportunity for us to let our sponsors know who you are. We don't want to track you. We don't want to do all of that. This survey is very quick to fill out and it is our way to gather that information and get an idea of who you are, what you like, etc. So please head to twit.tv slash survey 23. The last day to take it is January 31st. So that's right around the corner. Uh, so we'd love it if you did that. We like, uh, we want to get every listeners to every show, uh, in there, and because this is a new show, we particularly want to get you guys in. Absolutely. So, because you listen, to ask the tech guys, twit.tv/survey23. We would really like to get you represented in our uh, survey results. Um, if you are a Club Twit member, I thank you. It's because of Club Twit we're able to do this show. Uh, it's expensive to do anything on this network because we've got lights, cameras, staff. There's seven people who come in to do this show. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and honestly, at this point, it's really Club Twit that's keeping this on the air. If you're not yet a Club Twit member, investigate by going to twit.tv slash Club Twit. Add free versions of all the shows, including this one. Shows that we don't normally put out in public yet because they're not you know ready for primetime. They don't have a big enough audience, including Micah's Hands on Macintosh show. He brought back Hands on Macintosh, and I'm very grateful to him. It's a great show. Paul Thorat does Hands on Windows. We have the Untitled Linux show. we got a lot of great stuff. Uh, and uh, the Club Twit Discord, which is a great, wonderful place to hang. Again, twit.tv slash Club Twit, seven bucks a month. I think it's a, a pretty good deal. I think it's a really good deal, actually. Well, that's it for us, the tech guys. I hate to shut it down, but we, we got to go. Got stuff to do. Got stuff to do. Got a football game to win or lose. <laughs> right now, it's... Uh oh, is it not going well? Well, oh no, it's not over. It's not over, but it ain't it's over till the uh, the guy in the Eagles helmet <laughs> says, says so. Fly, Eagles, <laughs> fly. Thank you, everybody. Have a great week. We'll see you next time on Ask the Tech Guys. Bye bye. Yeah. If you love all things Android, well, I've got a show for you to check out. It's called All About Android, and I'll give you three guesses what we talk about. We talk about Android, the latest news, hardware, apps. We answer feedback. It's me, Jason Howell, Ron Richards, Wintwit Dow, and a whole cast of awesome characters talking about the operating system that we love. You can find All About Android at twit.tv slash AAA.